<laughs> okay, right. Uh, well, if everyone could, uh, well, okay, we'll see how we get on with bandwidth. If we have any bandwidth problems, we can change things. I'm going to do this talk in uh, in English. I'll mix a bit of Dutch in from time to time. I think, but just for the recording, let's make uh, cool. let's make everything. Let's make every, let's let's make it mostly English. Just to, just I'm to just in time. Fast, you're just in time. Absolutely. You're just in time. <laughs> it's an incredible <laughs> timing, uh, Joel. Uh, That's fantastic fast. timing. How do you use that? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, just to, just to confuse things further, uh, I've decided to change the name of this talk from Relativistic Quantum Mechanics for Engineering to Real Relativistic Quantum Mechanics. But okay, it's just a, uh, it, it, it's a secondary title or a... Uh, now, people involved in this are, of course, Martin, uh, who is sorely missed, and uh, quite a lot of the work I've been doing recently has been with Arnie Ben, who's joined us, uh, joined, who's an honorary fanart for the uh, an honorary fanart for the evening, and has joined us to listen to this thing. So, what what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about engineering, quantum mechanics for engineering, relativistic quantum mechanics for engineering. Now, that's something that we really don't do very much of. We tend to use Schrodinger quantum mechanics, and there are some very good reasons for that. But I want to try and Try, try and um, try and show how um, a slightly different quantum mechanics to Dirac quantum mechanics can give insights that otherwise are not uh, attainable with uh, with Dirac quantum mechanics with, with uh, the standard relativistic quantum mechanics. And in particular, I'm going to talk about states which are coherent states of light and matter that are mixed states of both elementary particles, protons, electrons, and their interactions, their bindings, their, 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 their forces, their, I'm going to call these things coherences. Because coherence both means that something is in phase and also that something sticks together. So I'm going to look at the coherences that are available in a different relativistic quantum mechanics. This is a relativistic quantum mechanics that Martin and I have been developing for, for uh, many decades and which you've heard quite a bit about in the past from talks from both, from both Martin and myself. But one of the things I'm going to be looking at is uh, one of the things that's going to be central to the talk is the dielectron boson. Now, what's the dielectron boson? It's the dielectron boson is the inner shell, the S shell of a helium atom. It's a pair of electrons, a spin up and spin down electron. Spin up and spin down electrons are very, very interesting. It's a very interesting object. It's a boson. It's got spin up and spin down. So the total spin is zero. But these things have very interesting properties. First of all, helium is very strongly bound, and it's a very beautiful object. It's a triboson. It's got a boson of protons, a boson of neutrons, and a boson of electrons. And it's, it, it also has a very much lower energy than the, than the trend of nuclear energies and the uh, nuclear binding energies. You see, you see uh, hydrogen's the lowest, and then it jumps up uh, very rapidly. And helium has a very, very low binding energy compared to, for example, lithium per, per nuclear. It's an extremely coherent object with an alpha particle as its uh, as its nucleus and uh, and a dielectron as its uh, as its outer shell so the key words in this coin in this talk in quantum mechanics talk are going to be resonant going to look for resonances for things that are a complete resonant object and that complete resonant object might be a single elementary particle it might be an atom or a molecule or it could be an entire crystal it could be an entire system harmonic harmonic in the sense that Vibrations can happen that are in harmony with one another, but they don't necessarily have to be on a single phase. There can be harmonies between different phases, harmonies of different frequencies, especially harmonies of a factor of two in frequency. So you have a fact in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the Williamson van der Mark electron model, one has a harmony between, between an oscillation which is within the photon, which is a two pi oscillation. And an oscillation going round and round a double loop, which is a four pi fermionic oscillation and a bosonic oscillation, which are in harmony with one another. And the other key word is going to be, as I said before, coherent, how things stick together. So the diagram in front of you is uh, is, is is not is it, it, it is in momentum space. It's the it's it, it's not it's, it's not in ordinary space. The projection onto ordinary space is a sphere. I'll come back and say some more about that. I've said stuff about it in the past as well. Now. Other people have been involved in this over the years. Some of you will find your names there as well, uh, but especially, of course, Martin, uh, it, who's responsible for at least half of anything worthwhile and what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. Now, um, this talk goes with a bunch of Stellingen, 
Um, so, so, so some of these are a bit might, might seem a bit strange, but I hope they'll all become clear by the end. First thing is that there are really I'm, I'm going to look at reality with two bases. Now, the basis that I'm going to work on is space time, space and time, relativistic space time. But not only space time, but also inverse space and inverse time. Now, the inverse unit elements here, the inverse of time, is time. A unit vector in time's inverse, a unit vector in time's inverse is a unit vector in time. The inverse in the Dirac metric of space, the inverse of a unit vector in space, one unit of x, is minus one unit of x, minus one unit of y, one, minus one unit of z. That's the plus, minus, minus, minus metric. But both, apparently, space, time, and inverse space and time, are treated in the same way, or are treated as, 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 as parts of a process, of parts of a dynamical process by nature. Because in the equations which we describe nature with, Maxwell's equations to begin with, the extended Maxwell's equations I'm going to talk about, they equate things which have inverse time and inverse space and space and inverse time with each other. And these apparently can balance one another in nature, whatever inversion means in nature. So those are going to be where two, ba two bases. Where inverse, uh, these two bases are interesting because space-time is, is, is sort of an extensive thing. It tells you where you, you by, by interval, you can, you can set up a matrix of where you are in space and time. But inverse space and inverse time. Inverse time is frequency space, and frequency space is very nearly energy space. In a quantum world, the energy is given by Planck's constant times the frequency. Inverse time is the quantum space, is the quantum time. And inverse space quantized, is the momentum. So the, so the, the space of inverse space and inverse time are bound up with energy and momentum. They're not quite the same because energy and momentum have different vector identities. Momentum is a bi-vector, energy is a scalar. But nonetheless, the inverse space and in, the, the difference is Planck's constant and E is H nu. E is not nu. E is H nu. But, uh, but inverse space and inverse time are really the, 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 the basis of reality in which quantum effects are, are manifest in the universe which we observe. So inverse time is kind of is the elementary energy. And also, in quantum mechanics, big is small. A big object has a small energy. And a small object, if you wind space-time up, if you wind a photon up, its energy becomes larger. So big is small, and small is large in the sense uh, between the size of an object, uh, the wavelength of an object, is inversely proportional to its energy. And also, inversion is the key to invariance. Now, Martin and I published a paper in June of this year um, uh, on that, and I'll be referring to that uh, during the talk as well. But inversion is the key to invariance and also the key to dynamics. This space and inverse space, time and inverse time, are mutually required in order to generate dynamics at all. Also, one other thing is that I'm going to suggest there actually exists an infinity of proper unities. What do I mean by that? I mean that a unit length, for example, you know, a unit length in feet and a unit length in meters, one foot or one meter, obviously different lengths. But if we're looking at a dynamical process, the only length that's important to any given dynamical process is its wave length. And, and a photon can have any wavelength. And for any photon, that wavelength is unity. So I can define an infinite set of unities. The fact that we have a mathematics with only one unity, math is nothing. That's our problem. We only have one unity. One could define a mathematics where you can make the unity just as big or as small as you like, feet or meters. And I'm also going to argue or show, no, I'll prove that relativity arise from, arises from proper inversion. And also that that's bound up with the linearity of different spaces of square root space and, and, and uh, square root energy and energy. And I'll show that as well. Simple maths. As I've mentioned above, dynamics before, dynamics and interaction also arise from division, again, from an inversion. And the relativity itself, I also wanted to note, you know this already, but relativity itself actually encompasses different realms, as well as the covariant realm of vector, of, uh, vector covariance. And, and I'm using covariance here in a different way to the way that it's sometimes perhaps used. And, and I'm, using it, I'm using covariance in the way that a vector transforms. If you transform a vector along the direction of motion, the vector gets shorter uh, during lens contraction, for example. 
Uh, you also have invariants like the mass or invariant interval. But I've, I'm defining a new term, orthovariance, things that like the electric field, which when you transform them in X, it's the Y, Z component of electric field that changes. The X component is unchanged for fields. That's just standard relativity. And I'm also going to argue the physical universe is, is not just four-dimensional, but it's multiply three-dimensional and multiply one-dimensional. And that these different dimensionalities, the four-dimensional, the different three dimensions, the different one dimensions, all fit together in a beautiful multi-dimensional jigsaw pattern. And all of them are important, three dimensions, four dimensions, and different combinations of them. But I mentioned at the beginning that, that we don't really use Dirac theory to describe physical reality, quantum reality. And, 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 and so why do we need a new theory? We need the new theory because, but for a couple of reasons. One is we need to go beyond the just energy approach of Hamiltonian and Lagrangian formulations of, uh, of quantum field theory, because energy isn't the only possible coherence. Another kind of coherence is, is the coherence that arises from spin. Things can only exist if they come round in a full circle and then start again and go round and round and round. They, they, they have a continuity only if they're phase coherent with themselves. So one needs to move, move beyond that and one needs to look into the spaces where that coherence is realized. And in fact, the space I'm going to talk about for that is quantum spin space. The new theory allows one to go start thinking in quantum spin space. And that's something which one certainly can't do in Schrodinger or Maxwell. There's no spin in it at all. And one can't really properly do in Dirac either because the spin space there is really pretty abstract. It's not good for thinking in. And also it's a bit mixed up because it's a mixed space between a four-dimensional Dirac algebra gamma matrix kind of space and a two-dimensional complex space, complex imaginary space. And that really messes you up in, in terms of thinking. We need a theory to be both fully, a proper theory, a proper in the relativistic sense theory, needs to be both fully relativistic to begin with at its basis, space-time, inverse space-time, properly relativistic, and it needs to end up being properly quantized. The quantization needs to flow naturally from the nature of the theory, not be put in here, there, and everywhere as first quantization, second quantization, maybe a third quantization. When I was looking at this stuff, I found people arguing about who's got the third kind of quantization after first and second quantization. Of course, that's a nonsense discussion. But nonetheless, um, uh, it, it mustn't be put in as a bunch of quantizations. It has to flow naturally from the theory if it's properly. And the nature isn't sticking in a bunch of rules. It, it, it operates as it operates. Now, Maxwell's theory itself is and always was fully relativistic. Even, even on Einstein's birthday, Maxwell was there with a fully relativistic theory. And the thinking, Einstein's thinking in the beginning was looking into proper transformations of light of Maxwell. But Maxwell alone is not complete. It ignores, completely ignores quantum spin and also it ignores flow. It ignores, it ignores the, the vector and trivector parts. It ignores the spin bit and the current bit or the vector potential bits of uh, or the, the, the of course, formulation system of the vector potential bits in, as you know from having studied this stuff at university. But, but uh, um, it, and also Maxwell had vector potentials too, but it ignores quantum spin. Now, uh, an, another thing is when Maxwell was developing and thinking his theory, he was thinking it in quaternions. Now, this approach was dropped because, and in favor of the heaviside Gibbs approach, because it was thought by him and others to be too hard for students in the beginning. And the, the, the vector, vector approach was simpler. But I think that generations, including all of us, I think we all learned uh, our vector algebras in the first sense. In the, uh, we learned vector algebras. We learned uh, vector products and things like that. But this is actually not thinking properly about the nature of what products between vectors do. Uh, X times Y gives you x in meters, y in meters, gives you something in square meters. It gives you an area, not another vector. Nonetheless, we do that kind of thing. This is not, this is, this is not thinking. This is unthinking. Now, Dirac theory is about 90 years old. It's brilliant. It's utterly beautiful. It introduces spin, but it's a, but it's a pretty obscure kind of spin. And the, the result in 2021 is that engineering uses pretty much Schrodinger, and it uses H psi as E psi almost exclusively. All the stuff we do in solid states is, is, is that. Okay, um, 
if we're looking in uh, if we're looking in quantum electronics, of course, we're looking at uh, first we're looking at second quantization. We're looking at creation of photons. We're looking at uh, creation of methylation operators, and that's kind of like a, a, a quantum electrodynamics, a partial quantum electrodynamics kind of kind of uh, kind of thinking. But this is not Dirac. This is not relativistic quantum mechanics. This is the creation. The, 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 the stuff we use for solid state physics is, or, or for chemistry, the whole of chemistry, is Schrodinger's so non relativistic quantum mechanics that actually is useful for engineering and useful for, for thinking about these processes. Now, Dirac, Maxwell, and Schrodinger are all clearly great theories. They're all a very big part of the description of reality. They're very good, but we nearly we need to do better if we're going to get spin properly understood. We need a proper theory to enable spin thinking. So. Okay, let's let's have a quick look at Dirac and say what, what, why is it proven relatively useless? Well, here's Dirac, ID slash minus M psi zero. You can do plus M as well if you like. Um, does both at once. A square root of uh, of, of um, the Klein-Gordon type equation. It's very very. Well, Dirac said that he found the theory very beautiful. It is a very beautiful theory, but it's kind of mixed in terms of. That d slash, what's the d slash? The d is, the d slash is a differential d by dx that includes a gamma matrix, and includes the proper gamma matrix associated with that x, gamma 1 for x, gamma 2 for y, gamma 3 for, for z, if you want to look at x, y, z. But look, there's an i in there as well. There's a, there's a, there's a 2d space, the complex space, as well as the 4d Dirac space that's implicit in the d slash. It's a mixed complex, hyper-complex, or mixed complex Dirac space. Now, Martin and I introduced this other equation, the d mu, is, d, d, d mu psi is equal to zero, without imaginary numbers there. This is a Dirac algebra, it's Clifford algebra CL13, which is isomorphic to the Dirac gamma matrix algebra without gamma five. Uh, it's, high, it's a simpler algebra than the mixed 2D, 4D algebra of Dirac, but it's still hyper-complex in the sense that there are many elements within an algebra that square to negative unity. But look, the equation is even, look at it, the equation is even more beautiful. In, in, in the Dirac equation, you're treating the dynamics, the, 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 the momentum operators different, and energy operators differently to the mass. Mass has been put into Dirac as something, well, it's got to have a rest mass, so let's just shove one in there somewhere. In Williamson van der Mark theory, the mass comes in as a as a dynamical variable. It comes in as a as as a, as a rest mass field, actually, actually a, a rest a dual rest mass field, a rest mass and dual rest mass uh, field, on the same basis as the electromagnetic field. So it's put in, in a different and more um, integrated way. In Williamson van der Mark, but otherwise the theory is very similar and it has similar solutions, as it's uh, just just as the Laplace equation has similar solutions to the Helmholtz equation and so forth. They're very similar structured equations. Why? Because the d mu in Williamson van der Mark is identical to the d slash in Dirac. It's that bit without the i. So it's very nearly the same theory in, except for the fact basis of psi and, and, and psi here are different. Psi is a spinner basis and psi is a basis of mass, vector potential, field, spin. So the basis of the Williamson van der Marek theory is a real basis of quantities that are physical and measurable. So what's going wrong with Dirac? Well, Dirac was developed when Schro when quantum mechanics was brand new, and people had developed wave functions like psi is, e, e, is a e to i to the kx minus omega t. Beautiful stuff that was that was brand new at the time, and it, it seemed such a beautiful thing you didn't want to get rid of it. So, so the wave functions that are introduced in, in, in Dirac are, are complex exponential wave functions we use in Schrodinger quantum mechanics. But the problem with the complex imaginary is it's actually too simple. It doesn't get the non-commutativity of 3D space that was inherent in Maxwell's thinking with quaternions. And also doesn't properly distinguish the mass field relation. The way you put field in Dirac, you have to bring it in through through, through the vector potential and a, a coupling which affects the phase. So you bring it in Lagrangian field theory as something which, which affects the, the change of phase through the charge times the vector potential, EA term. 
which, uh, which, which is a contribution to the phase. Now, that's good, but it isn't good enough. It needs to, we need to do better. So the Psi there is in spinner space, and the field is brought in through the vector potential. But where the real problem lies is the Dirac isn't real. It's living in an imaginary world, and that imaginary world is not physical. It doesn't have... A, when you're looking at the vibration in Dirac, you have energy somewhere, and then it goes somewhere else. And okay, you pull it back by making the product Psi star Psi, product of, the, of an object with its complex conjugate. This is a mathematical trick. And remember, maths is nothing. It's stuff that we make up. What the universe does is something different, probably. Now, the Psi in Williamson van der Mark is in physical field, spin, dynamical mass, and current. And it's bookended by real and dual rest mass things. It's bookended by things which are invariant, the, the rest mass and the dual rest mass. It has a pair of objects that transform like four vectors, that is, obviously the four vector transforms like a four vector, but also the tri-vector term representing spin also transforms largely, at least in terms of the size of it, as a four vector. Signs are different under certain kinds of transformations. But the fields are orthovariant. They transform differently. They transform as the electromagnetic field. We know how they transform. It's in the big textbooks. They transform perpendicular to the direction of a Lorentz transformation. And the subset D, now if I take the Williamson van der Mark D mu psi G and look at the subset where I just look at the four differential of the six field, then that is precisely all four free space Maxwell's equations. So they contain Maxwell's equations with some extra bits in there. We'll look at those in a minute. I've talked about them before, but um, for those of you not familiar with it, they're coming up very shortly. So these are the proposed equations of, the, of, equations of motion of the sub-quantum fluid. Thinking about before we have quantized anything, what's happening in the dynamics of the bits of space and time that go to make up relativistic quantum mechanics? How is relativistic quantum mechanics substructured? And the hope is that if we haven't has new thinking from a new basis, that leads to new materials, new devices, and things that can be engineered that otherwise couldn't be engineered. And that's what the talk's about. So I'm going to come back to this uh, uh, the, the, this later as well, the, the, the inversion of spherical distribution. Inversion of a spherical, uh, uh, of a circular distribution is a bicircular distribution. So that's, that's simple. What, what, what one does is one takes a proper lens scale. Proper lens scale is the, the wavelength ones in the wavelength of an exchange photon, for example, gives you a lens scale, the wavelength of the exchange photon. If one inverts in a, in a, in a, in a circle, of, of that wavelength, a distribution like the charge distribution of an emitting system. So one has a circular charge distribution, a spherical charge distribution, which uh, undergoes a transition and out pops a photon. That photon goes over and it, uh, sp it speeds through space and it goes somewhere else. In order for that photon to be absorbed somewhere else, that photon is a field with electric and magnetic field, to be absorbed to a scalar energy, in order for a field to become a scalar, it has to find something that looks like its inverse. Thing times its inverse is, is the scalar unity. And the scalar unity for a photon, as I've mentioned before, for me is, 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 its, is its wavelength. So it needs to find something which is its inverse wavelength in length, but is inverse field in three dimensions. And the inverse field of a spherical distribution is either a bispherical or a toroidal distribution. But the inverse of a circle in a circle is another circle. The inverse of a big circle is a small circle, etc. So circles invert to circles and fields invert to fields. And I need to find an inversion of both of those, have something which either creates a photon from the system or destroys creation or uh, destruction operators. Although the ones we use are much simpler than the thing I'm talking about. So um, the differential dynamics I'm going to talk about leads to a whole bunch of derived spaces, to four derived three spaces and four derived one spaces, a 16-component multi-vector space, uh, the space of CL13, or the space of the Dirac matrices, if you like, and their products. 
So, um, so a relativistic quantum mechanics space has Dirac has 32 because it has 16 from the Dirac matrices plus times two from real and imaginary. So and this space is a bit simpler than Dirac space in that it's 16 components, but 16 is enough to make things quite complicated indeed. So um, the, the base theory uh, I've talked about uh, in a previous paper, June 2019, uh, is dmu psi g is equal to zero. So what is dmu? Well, dmu is a, a differential operator. So there it is in gory detail, d by d alpha mu dx mu, but the, the, that, that alpha mu is a Dirac matrix. It's the alpha, it's the Dirac matrix, um, zero, uh, label zero for time, one, two, three for space, uh, x, y, z, r, theta, phi, or whatever. And if I write that out in full, then I have a, a differential times the inverse of the time component alpha zero is alpha zero. The inverse, the implicit inverse in the differential, one over, one over alpha two, alpha one, one over alpha two, one over alpha three. 1 over alpha 1 is minus alpha 1, because alpha 1 squared is minus 1, etc. That's the metric appearing in the differential. That's a dirac clifford four vector different derivative. And that acts on a, 60, a potentially 16 component object. What are the 16 components? Well, the psi mu's, let me just switch something with a cursor. The psi mu's, this term just here, that's the, that's the four vector, x, x, y, t, x, y, z. These are the fields that psi mu use. They are the four differential of the four vector potential. So, so dA by dt is the electric field, and, and curl of A is the magnetic field, conventionally, and also here. So this is the scalar term, this one just here. This is the trivector. These are the spins. These are, going to, these are the spin terms. This thing is the dual mass density term it's the we call it the quetchhog the quantum hedgehog a four dimensional so four it, it, it's a directed four volume element so it can either be inward directed or outward directed hence hence hedgehog like spines out of spines in but quetchhog because it's four four of them four, four dimensional so that's that's them it's a one a four a six a four and a one it's, it's triangles always in these things so what, what one has in in the theory is one has one element well, that's a square root mass energy density square root energy density so root joules are the units and those root joules can play around by jumping from up or down one 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 index so if you've got something in the vector and you hit it with a four vector differential some of it will go to the scalar and some will go to the field but some will go to the field well, that's the four differential of the vector potential is the field right so that's what you want. It, it, it works exactly the same. It's just a vector algebra, as 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 it has done for the last hundred years or so, as you would hope. So, uh, but here it is written out in terms of something which ha is, it, it. I call this absolute relativity. Why? Because everything is absolute. You cannot have. You are not allowed in the mathematics to have any element that doesn't properly have its unit vector associated with it. If you have a little bit of space, you have d x, have a little bit of space, that had better be associated with the unit vector in the x direction. Otherwise, it's not real. The, the dx tells you how much space you've got it, and, 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 and the alpha mu tells you that it is in that direction. This is your direction, and that's your magnitude for a proper vector. And it's a proper vector in the, in the relativistic sense. And if you don't do every single little bit relativistically, you're going to mess up. Because you're going to do products and quotients, you're going to have lots of things running through one another. And it has to be, the point is, to do this right, you have to get the basis right. And if you don't get the basis right, you're in the mist. You can forget about it. So, so that's, 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 that's how the theory is constructed. And what does it do? Well, here, here is the whole thing. So if you do the four differential of the 16 components, you're obviously going to get 64 terms. There they are. Forget about looking at that. Look at this. Uh, they can be written because you'll find that, that, that the, this, this is all the size. Uh, psi zero one, for example, is the, is, the, is the electric field in the x direction. Or will turn out to be the electric field in the x direction. So, um, 
so and and psi one two is the magnetic field in the z direction as, as another example uh, psi zero three one is spin in y um so so these terms can all be identified directly with physical objects with phys quantum spin in y but look, look at the patterns here the patterns here are the patterns that you're be familiar with three-dimensional uh three vector algebra they're they're, 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 they're sort of x t y minus y t x kind of terms for the curl terms so you can write these in the conventional form if you make the identification that i just did in terms of electric field the magnetic field the spin t the um mass terms p and q this this is like real and imaginary mass if you just took p and q p and q by themselves are isomorphic to complex numbers but they're not isolated here because they're mixed into a to a um to, to an algebra. The, the, the psi two threes together with the scalar are isomorphic to quaternions. In this algebra, embedded quaternion algebras and complex algebras as subalgebras of the CL13 algebra. So the CL13 algebra isn't a division algebra, which makes it a little bit of a no-no amongst many theoretical philosophers because it's got nasty properties. They one thinks, one might think. Turns out it's not really as bad as all that as we'll try and show. Anyway, if you if you rearrange these, what you find to your utter astonishment is you just get ma except for the p's and q's, which um, which are the mass terms. So in photon is massless, p's and q's are zero. So for light, it's just Maxwell's equations. The first four equations are just Maxwell's equations. Um, time derivative v e, curl of b, time derivative um, curl of e, time derivative of b. These are the, the, those first four equations are just four Maxwell's equations with some extra mass bits in them. Uh, or some extra mass density parts or root mass density parts in them. To get energies here, you need to square stuff up, just like the energy density of electric fields are half epsilon e squared, for example. The, the energy density in the quantum field is psi star psi. These things are these quantities are all at the level of square root quantities if you want to look at energy density, just like psi in quantum mechanics. And they always were. You know, that, that was for Maxwell the case. This is this is not 100 years old, it's 150 years old, this kind of thinking. So, so, so energies here are really squared quantities. And, uh, and but what you get is to get an extra four equations. That is just the Lorentz gauge. The fifth equation here is the Lorentz gauge equation. That's encouraging, isn't it? You have to use that anyway, try and get some solutions to Maxwell. Maxwell under constraint, there's an extra constraint. But look what you got here. That's a spin gauge. Have you played with one of those before? Isn't that beautiful? There are two gauges there. Both have to be satisfied for solutions. This is far more strongly constrained than Maxwell's equations are because there are extra equations, extra constraints. And there are a couple of analogous equations to the curl and time derivative things in spin and vector potential. These are very, very beautiful equations. Now, so here's what they all are. And if you want energy, you just, the energy for this thing, if you've got a bunch of stuff in PQ, you've got to be a bit careful because you mustn't double count. Because you have a set of linear equations relating these things, if you look in the spin, and spin's an easy way to look at energy, the energy, or, or well, inverse time is a very easy way to look at energy. E is H nu. Energy is Planck's constant times the frequency. That gives, that gives you energy, boom, just like that. However, if you want it in field, what you want to do is you want to integrate over e squared and b squared, eventually p squared and q squared, and then integrate over the whole volume, which is relevant. That'll give you an energy density. Well, well, in energy, if p, q, e, and b are expressed in root energy, then uh, density units and root joules, and they'll give you an energy density, quite obviously. And it is the energy density. You can also get it by summing up the squares of the t's and the a's. Uh, but not both, because one or the other. Right. Uh, just a minute. Can I ask you something? Excuse me. Yes, you certainly can. Oh, hi, Ruslan. You're in. Hi. Nice, hi, nice to see you. Yes. Nice to see you. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you go uh, one slide back? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning because I had this uh, meeting at school. It's uh, being recorded, Ruslan, so you can catch up. Okay, that, yeah. that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. I, I like this theory, by the way, very much. And I heard the first presentation a couple of years ago from. Uh, um, um, Mark, Mark, Martin. Mark, 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 Mark. 
Martin, yeah, Martin, sorry. And yeah, uh, unfortunately he passed away, but uh, I was really, uh, yeah, that, uh, I really liked it very much, yeah. And now I'm liking uh, what you are <laughs> adding to that here. Uh, but uh, now I'm trying to uh, remember uh, how energy was defined actually in pure electrodynamics. Uh, it's, you start from mechanical energy, you have this movement of charges and stuff. And if you try to define that mechanical energy, you will see that uh, it's not conserved anymore. And in order to make it conserved, you need to add this field energy, and that's how you derive the field energy, as far as I remember. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, right. what, that's what is in Jackson, in Jackson right? That's, that, that, that's right. You have a problem. It's in, it's in Feynman as well. You have a problem that if you, if, if you just try and look at those energies, you find that famous relation E is three quarters mc squared. You're missing a part of the energy, unless you include the field energy. Yes, that's mm -hmm. well known. But look, I haven't quantized anything yet. Recently. No, no, I'm not talking about quantum whatsoever. I'm just wondering, uh, yes. you kind of postulating that the energy is just the sum of the square of the fields, and somehow you choose those fields. I don't really understand why. Well, look, in conventional physics, the energy density in the electric field is the half epsilon east squared. It's the electric field squared. This is just big book physics. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I mean, uh, there it makes sense because of these steps, you know, coming from mechanical energy towards the field and field energy can't you do something like some something something like that here because if you have masses then you can say okay this is my mechanical no, energy no, of course energy. you don't have any masses yet you only have a mass density ah, oh okay so you only have now uh, fields pure fields we haven't, no we no matter anything nothing. yet we're just looking we're just looking at more for stuff at the moment so right so 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 you don't yet have those problems we might get to them later if we try but okay. for the time being for the time being we're just talking about sub quantum mechanics we haven't we haven't actually got a quantized particle yet we're going to do that uh, shortly yeah so so in order to understand for me um, just, um uh, can i try to formulate so so you have you have some equation which you you see you say uh, this equation is uh, beautiful because of uh, a number of reasons which uh, i believe and then you say okay this equation acts on a number of fields and then you interpret these fields the way that this is an electric field this is a magnetic field and so on so you at the moment you only have fields nothing yeah. else right okay no 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 you have you have what well it depends what you what you mean by fields yes they are fields but some of these fields are a spin field mm -hmm. imagine a spin field so that's yeah, a field a spinner of, a field it's a no it's not a spinner a spinner it's is not. an object it's a quantum spin field. It's a, it's a spin which is distributed in the same way that a field is distributed. Okay, so if you, if you walked into a spin field, uh, say, imagine a field of grass. But okay. The grass is, each, gra each, each grass blade is spinning perpendicular to the grass blade. So mm -hmm. the grass is a vertical, and the spin is entirely in the x, y, t plane, mm -hmm. where the grass is pointing in z. Now that... Okay. A quantum spin is a, is a spin field. So so each grass blade, if you think about the adjacent grass field, the spin on the adjacent grass field is in the opposite direction. So the net spin integrated between the two is zero. The spin only appears yep. at the edge of such a field. Uh, so, 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 so 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 this is this is this is an intensive property. All of these are intensive properties. None of them are extensive. None of them are particle-like at all. They're all field like in that sense but the only true yeah. fields here are the electric and magnetic field the other things are you don't call the vector potential a field okay although you could call it a field yeah you could that, call it that's indeed, a, yeah. yes and 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 you don't really call the quantum spin a field either you think it's some sort of weird stuff which has weird properties that's what we tend to do in physics yeah that's true. Uh -huh. so, so so and yet here is a spin field and then also we have a mass field and a dual mass field so, so, so yes, these are fields in the sense that I've just explained, but they are not, it's not just the fields which one's familiar with. The B squared and B squared are exactly the electromagnetic field. Okay. But the B squared and Q squared are different kinds of things. They're, if you like, they're, 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 what you could call them, uh, gauges have got mixed up. People don't understand gauges. They think they understand gauges, but they don't. Most, most people I talk to about gauges, it becomes very clear after a, few minutes they haven't got a clue what they're talking about oh. i'm talking about people who you know give write books on this <laughs> so there's, there's a beautiful book by a colleague of mine uh, john davis where he talks about gauge fields and he's a wonderful physicist so he sits there and he does some calculations and he gets solutions that depend on the gauge he says, but they shouldn't depend on the gauge of course the gauge invariant and then yeah. because he's a brilliant physicist he goes hmm? you know look at this this is wrong and he's right it is wrong he was wrong so but it's, yeah. it's ignorance and well, it, 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 people don't understand them properly. 
And you see, that going back to this, uh, this is the Lawrence gauge, but here's another gauge. And, and, and the thing, a gauge is originally set a scale, but the gauge we have now doesn't set a scale. E to the i theta is a, is, 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 is a unit circle where you don't know, in fact, in, in uncertainty relation, you say that you uh, canonically don't know what the phase is. This mm -hmm. is something one cannot know. Anyway, since somebody says one cannot know something to me, then that's exactly where I want to go and have a look at it. So, um, so, so but, but yeah, yeah. Look, your, your, comment, your comments are very good. I'm glad you asked the question. But the, the, these things are not, in, uh, are not to be related to stuff which automatically has a picture which requires particles at this stage. It's going to in okay. a minute. Well, forget about particles. It's just, uh, I'm, I'm open to everything. So, uh, you know, uh, as Fetzer once said, uh, once you study theoretical physics, you can accept everything. So uh, it's, 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 it's a great question. Let's come back to it at the end, though, and and uh, and, and discuss it once we've got particles, and but, then we can have but, a but just about the, uh, time problem. Can I just one maybe? Yeah. Of my understanding, so you say this T and A are spinner fields, or spin no, fields? No, sorry. no, 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 no. There are no spinners in here whatsoever. The spinners. Okay. okay. Here what are what are the you, you call them? Spin fields, right? Spin fields, not spinner fields. Okay, Very sorry. different. Spin fields. A spin, a so what are the spin fields which, in these equations? Is that T and A? T. No, e. just T. Okay. T zero and T. A and is the. Why is that in spin field? Why is that in spin field? Because it, I, I'll explain that. Okay. <laughs> right. I, I'll show you why it's a spin field. It's because okay. it's momentum times a perpendicular vector. So. Ah. So okay. And you interpret it that way because it's momentum. No, I don't interpret it that way. That's what a spin is. Spin. Uh, the, 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 you, you, when, when we're talking about spin as as as, as school kids. Uh -huh. We define spin as being something going round round in circles, right? Spinning around like a bicycle wheel. Uh -huh. so, 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 so when humans talk about spin in whichever language we talk about it, that's what we're thinking about. Really? But the, okay. The, the, yeah, right. That's, that's where we get our concept of what spin is. But quantum spin isn't that. It never was, as you know. Yeah, of course. Quantum spin is is, is 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 whatever something that if you rotate by uh, by two pi, uh, you get a minus of that. Thing. That's basically the well. It is. It is for a fermion. Yes, that's that's true for a fermion, but not for a boson. If you rotate by two pi, you don't get a minus. So oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. So look, we'll, we'll come okay, to that. But well. this, I'm saying this is a spin field because. Sorry, I'm identifying this with a spin field, but I'm going to talk about the spaces in detail in this talk. Okay, fine. Think? Yeah, we'll go on then. Okay, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, if I ask these stupid questions or uh, they they take uh, you know too long time to answer, just yes. uh, say that okay later you'll understand. That. I just did, really <laughs> but it was, it was a good question up to now, but I just, okay, let's go on, let's, let's press on. Sure, yeah, okay. yeah. thanks. Uh, any more questions while I'm, any more questions while I'm there? Okay, I'll, I'll press on here. Look, we're looking at something here, which is a vector differential. What the vector differential does, every time you hit, so you have an object, and the way we humans describe the, the the dynamics of in Maxwell's equations is a four vector differential of a six field. So we, we, we're familiar with these things. We've had this formalism all our lives, basically. So what does it mean? It means if you hit something with a, if you hit a bivector, a field with a vector derivative, the, the field is, a, is itself the derivative of a vector potential. So you hit the vector potential with a, with a derivative, you get two kinds of terms. You get bivector terms and scalar terms. If you hit the bivector with a derivative, in other words, if you hit the vector term with a vector derivative, that's an odd derivative of an odd number of indices, you're going to get an even number of indices. And if you hit a vector derivative onto a bivector with an even number, you're going to get an odd number. So the effect of the vector derivative is to switch even to odd and back again. Elsewhere in this is once moving between vector potential and field, for example, and then from field to spin, and then round circuits. So I'm going to show what those circuits look like in Maxwell's equations in a diagram later. So, but the, the thing to take away at the moment is that the vector derivative takes you from odd to even or even to odd. And here is a diagram of those transformations of all possible transformations in colors. So if you like, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide a little bit of the top line by a little bit of the side line. So for example, I'm going to do, um, I'm going to do, uh, so, so, so along the top line is yellow at the top, very top left is, um, is the pivot term. It's just, it's the scalar, it's the scalar unity. So the number, if you like, it's, 
it's not quite the number one, but it's, uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the thing that acts like a number one in the algebra. And then the next term is, I uh, can't see this very well, I'm going to expand it just a moment, let's just make this a bit bigger. Aha. There we go. Right, everybody's, okay, so you've got alpha p, that's the pivot term, that's the scalar term. Alpha zero is time, alpha one is x, two is y, z, x, y, z, orangey terms. Alpha two, three, three, one, one, two, well that's your magnetic field, blue. Alpha zero, one, alpha zero, two, alpha zero, three. That's your magnetic field in the equations we've just had. Alpha zero, two, three, spin in the missing index. That's spin in the x direction. Spin in the y direction, spin in the z direction. Alpha one, two, three, that's the hedgehog, the directed volume edge element. Either it spines out or spines in. Hedgehog in or outward. Volume either inward or outward direction. Directed. And alpha zero, one, two, three is the hedgehog. Now when you do the top line divided by the, um, the vertical line, alpha p divided by alpha p. Any element divided by itself is the scalar, obviously. So you get yellow um, objects down the diagonal, which is just the scalar, obviously. So, um, so, but the others, for example, if I do alpha zero divided by the scalar, that's also that remains alpha zero. So those remain the same if I divide by the scalar, same sort of object. And these things form patterns. I mean, look at these patterns. And these patterns are actually isomorphic to lower dimensional algebras. The top left square with the bluish things in it, those are, those are, those are the ones down the diagonal of the scalar still. The other three are the quaternions. That is a quaternion square. If I just take those objects, that's a subalgebra, which is self-contained, a subalgebra of the algebra. It's the quaternion algebra. Look, it appears, those boxes also appear down the diagonal. Quaternion, 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 quaternion. If I look at the other diagonal, top right downwards, that's the spin stuff. They're the spin fields. And John, I'm very sorry to interrupt you. I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but I don't see the whole slide. That's first of all. And second, I would really help if you could point to things, not just only call them. These, these are quaternions. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. That one, that one, that one. This is the spins down okay. here. Okay. Yeah. Right. Things. The difference between the, the, these are like copies of the quaternions, but they're not quaternions. They're not self-contained. These boxes, that box, if you just take those four elements, yellow, um, light, darker and darker, um, gray, then any products in those remain within that group. That is the group of quaternions. These other boxes, that's not the case. They're, they're not self-contained. If you just take this object and this object, the two yellow ones, the thing in the dual, they're isomorphic to complex numbers. But again, within the group, they're not self-contained because as soon as you start multiplying by other things, you pull yourself out of that group. So there are, there are subgroups within the group. And those subgroups have a dimensionality. Look, these are three-dimensional groups. The quaternions are three-dimensional, not four-dimensional. This whole thing is four-dimensional space-time. But the structure of it is such that three-dimensional spaces are embedded within that four-dimensional space-time. And these three-dimensional spaces are, electric fi are magnetic field space, electric field space, space space, this is space space, this box just here. This is electric field, uh, wait a minute, green, no, sorry, I, I was wrong about this one. This is, this is uh, green ones are electric field space. Where's spin space? Just a minute, spin space is the alpha zero three ones, that's the purple ones, that's these ones, these are spin space. That's spin space, that's spin space. It's a brown box alpha zero. Spin space goes with time. Space, time, and spin are, are a group just here. Anyway, these are magnetic, uh, let me just get this right, uh, vector space, uh, spin space, and electric field space. And of course, they, they, there are four copies of each because of the products uh, they give you, give you different copies. So I'm going to show you the whole slide now. Sorry about that. In fact, I'll play it again. So, so there it is. There's the whole slide. I'm talking about the embedding of complex numbers and quaternions in space time. And this, we call, Arnie came up with a name for this, Mathematics of Absolute Relativity Theory, and in honor of Martin, because that's marked for Martin. And these spaces interlock in a beautiful multidimensional pattern. This particular picture is due to an ex-student of mine, Innes Anderson Morrison, so thanks to him. And he's also written a series of tools in Python and Rust, which you can go into bicycle.com, our website, and play with if you'd like to. So the projections here include quaternions, they're complex numbers, three space of electric field space, 
three space of magnetic field space and the three space of spin space. Electric field space is and always was three dimensional. There are only three components of electric field, not four. There are only three components of magnetic field, not four. And of course, there are six components of the electromagnetic field, electric plus magnetic, which are really the space one's talking about. But, but these spaces are separate within the four dimensional space of Clifford 13, CL13 space. Uh, so actually, the things I've got here, quantum, space, quantum spins top right, is wrong. So I'm sorry about that, Rosalind. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad those questions were asked because I've got it wrong here. I've not looked carefully enough. And of course, but these are the space of d mu psi g is zero. So, so, so that's how they fit together. And, and there's this bunch of three spaces embedded in this four space through quotients. The, the fundamental thing that's happening in d mu psi g for the unit vectors. Apart from all the differential stuff, a little bit of this divided, a little bit of space divided by a little bit of time, velocity, right? Um, dx by dt, that's what you're doing. But you're also dividing a unit space, alpha 1, by a unit time, alpha 0. And dividing alpha 1 by alpha 0 gives you alpha 0, 1, gives you a bivector, gives you a momentum, well, it gives you a velocity. If you multiply the mass, some dimension of mass, mv is, the momentum is mv, classically. So something in the direction of the momentum, anyway. So th there's another thing that one could do. I've done d mu psi g, but I don't. I, you know, those are vector derivatives. I could do other derivatives. I could do a spin derivative. I could derive by the spin. I could, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Anyway, uh, just for reference, I'm just going to show this. You can do all possible derivatives, all possible spaces, and they work like that. That is the full equation, dgg. So that's the um, that's the complete derivative, 16 derivative of the 16 component algebra. And there it is for reference with the proper signs in for the Dirac metric and the ordering where rightmost is innermost. So if you we've tried different possibilities here, and that's probably not the whole story, it turns out. Uh, but um, again, these are things that there are tools on bicycle.com that one can play with if one wishes. But that's just an aside. That's um, what I want to talk about are wave functions. Now, normally we do a wave function with a complex exponential. So, but here we don't have the complex number. We don't have I. But this algebra supports com complex like hyper complex wave functions, just as, just as, in just the same way that you, you t turn a falling or a rising exponential to, to something which oscillates by multiplying the exponent by square root of minus one. You don't have 10 square roots of minus one, and every one of them does the same thing. Here's an example. E to the alpha 3 kz is cos kz plus alpha 3 sine kz. Uh, you, it, it, it's trivial. You just write down the power series, expand it, and you'll see that's, that's just the case. These, these things act perfectly well as, 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 um, as, um, as, as, as wave generating things, as do complex, as does the complex imaginary, except you've got 10 of them. But if I'm using absolute relativity, I'm not allowed to write down z without an alpha 3. So in the exponent, I'll go back to having a pointer. So in the exponent just here, there's my z. kz is going to be a phase. That's an inverse space. But the whole thing has to be in the direction of alpha 3. I'm not allowed to not write it with alpha 3. And alpha 0 here, omega t. That, that, that thing is a traveling wave. I've just written it here, cos kz plus alpha 3 sine kz. If this thing squares to plus one, alpha zero, that would be shine, cosh plus shine. That's a falling exponential or a rising exponential. The whole thing is not a wave because the alpha zero squares to plus one. But I can make something that's a wave in two ways. Like if I multiply by anything with three indices, by alpha zero, one, two, then that gives me alpha zero, one, two, three, which squares to minus one for the set. Bed, and it gives me alpha one, two, which squares to minus one for time. That's a wave function. In fact, I think it's an element of the electron wave function multiplied by something which converts this to whatever I want, energy or probability density or whatever else, like root energy or probability density. Or root that, density. I, I dare to say I don't understand that. Uh, I'm sorry, I think, uh, John. I think that a, a lot of people went for us and you're not alone there. All I've, okay. all I've done is exactly, if you, if you imagine alpha 3 is the square root of minus 1, it is a square root of minus 1. Sure, yeah, some some sort of an element of some algebra. Yeah, so you understand e to the i theta equals cos theta plus i sine theta, right? 
uh, well, just the same Euler, Euler formula, yeah? <laughs> that's right. That's exactly the same equation, but alpha 3 written instead of i. But there are 10 hey, John, I. John, yeah, John, the, the, uh, the uh, Euler-like equation that you have written here, uh, only uh, you can only derive it uh, with a Taylor series uh, for, for a given uh, algebra for, uh, for L, alpha 3. And this algebra yeah. is the same as that of, uh, of the complex plane. It's exactly the same, yes. So, so, yeah. so the algebra is so, one alpha so why, three. So why, yeah, why, why then is alpha three not equal to i? Because um, you've also got alpha two and alpha one and uh, alpha one two, which all also square to minus one. There are many roots of minus one. There are ten of them. But uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so th that I understand. What I don't understand is that you say uh, this uh, xi equals to he zero. Uh, I don't know what. This letter is called in English. Alpha zero one two. Alpha yeah. Zero, so so how how does this uh, uh, come in? Uh, alpha zero one two, and then suddenly you say it's an electron wave function. That that's the part no, I don't. No, know. I didn't say. I, I said it was a wave function, I, and I think that it's an element of an electron wave function. Oh, okay, how okay, but in, yeah. How it but comes could you explain the step, please? Could you explain the step? Yes, how this yes, alpha yes, zero one yes, two comes in? Yes, yes, yes. It's exactly the same step as you had before. If I write e to the e to the power x e to the power x is that function whose differential is itself. It's the only function that's whose differential is itself. Okay. So d by dx of e to the x is e to the x. Now, there are a series of related functions to that, uh, the shines and the sines, which also have the property that either the even derivative or the fourth, always the fourth derivative is equal to itself. So the fourth derivative of sine is sine. Okay. So, 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 so okay. So, so, so what I've done here, if I, if, if I have something which squares to plus one, like the real number like the real number on, on the real number line x, e to the x right. describes, yep. a, describes a falling exponential or rising exponential. If I want to convert that to a wave, I write the exponential e to the ix. Now that right. represents the wave, right? Right. I've done exactly the same thing here, except um, in, in a more complex, in, in a hyper complex. Yeah, space, but, but, but why, why alpha 0, 1, 2? Why not alpha, uh, whatever? You had so many different alphas. I mean, you, you could use here spin, uh, for example, the spin alpha. No, you can't. No, you can't. There are yeah. only a few that work. The alpha 0, 1, 2 is the spin in the z direction. All this right. is the z wave function. So it's the okay. particular one for z. I need to use alpha uh, 0, 2, 3, the spin in the x direction. If I wrote kx, that would be an alpha 0, 2, 3. Yeah, and this alpha zero one two multiplied by alpha three. What does it give us? Alpha zero one two three. Ah, the, the last we, one in the row. That's right, and that that is very similar to the complex number square root of minus one, uh -huh. because that and the scalar are a subalgebra which is isomorphic to complex numbers. Right, and this algebra is called Dirac Clifford algebra. You said, or uh, called the Dirac Clifford algebra, or CL properly CL one three. CL one three is that algebra whose products are unity, so that is mm -hmm. uh, x, x squared is taken to be 1. A uh, Clifford algebra is where products are unity, a, a Grassmann algebra is where products are 0. So, right. um, so, so it is that algebra where 1 element squares to plus CL1 plus comma 3, 3 squared to minus. So it's that Clifford algebra with a metric plus minus minus minus. Okay. Clifford okay. algebra CL3, 1 is, is the Majorana algebra, which is with 3 squared to plus three that squares plus and one that squares to minus with a metric mm -hmm. plus 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 minus, which is another possibility. Right, but I'm using the direct metric here. Okay, fine, fine. Okay, uh, maybe a bit yeah, more uh, clear. Thank you. I'll just uh, go on then. Thank uh, you. For the, thanks for the question, Russell. I, I have made it clear by answering your question, I hope. But, but, <laughs> but, um, but, but, um, but to answer Francis' question as well, Francis, you're right about the Taylor expansion. You just write it down as the Taylor expansion with the algebra where alpha 3 squared is 1, and then the whole thing, for, so, 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 so you get as a product, you, you, you have, first of all, um, one, then times alpha three, you get alpha three, and then you get minus one, and then you get minus alpha three, and then you get I one. I think it, it, alpha so three it's, squared it's, should be equal to minus one, and you get, uh, and you get this, right. uh, yeah. Yes, that's, that's what it is. So alpha three is one of the root, roots of unity in the algebra. But, but pure formula, can't you just for, postulate that? You can actually postulate this formula, can't you? I could postulate it, but I haven't. Just yeah, I understand. Well, yeah. Maths. Yeah, why well, well, postulate it when it's just maths? Well, uh, yeah, but you're right. for, me, you it's not, for me, it's not. For me, it's not obvious that uh, Taylor expansion can be applied here immediately. 
So just uh, have to sit down with a pencil and paper, Rosalind, and have a. All right, all right. No, I mean, I trust you. If you say it's really applicable and everything's fine. Exercise, exercise for the listener. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's good. It's good fun. It's a nice. It's a nice little exercise. Take you five minutes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So the new theory affords the possibility of writing ways without imaginary numbers. Right. Now remember, Carlo was saying. There's proof that you can't have quantum mechanics without complex numbers. He's kind of half right. You can't have quantum mechanics without at least complex numbers, is the correct statement. You need to have something that you can do it with quaternions. You can do it with anything that has objects that square to minus one. Because the problem is that you need to equate a couple of different things on two sides. And for that, you need co complex or more complex numbers. Now, in absolute relativity, the rule is that one must always write the exponent with its proper space-time form. So there is that thing again. This isn't a traveling way, but it comes one if you exponentiate it. I'm doing the same slide again, aren't I? Why am I doing the same slide again? I mean, anyway, here we are. Stop and do the next slide. But I, I, I want to switch a little bit to talk about light. Light, the Lorentz contraction reduces the entire universe to a single point. So if you're looking at something far away and long ago, it's here and now for the light. And the emission absorption for any photon line, for any light line, occurs at the same point in space-time for that line. So according to the exchange photon, emission absorption occurs at the same point in space-time. Now, remember the photon energy is its inverse time scale, e is h nu h bar omega. The inner scale of light is its eigenunity. Eigen meaning own, and unity, it's its own, its own one. Now, I'm going to... Um, when I come to the photon wave function in a minute, I'll see what I mean. You need this, otherwise the maths is going to blow up. So, actually, let's get on to that, rather than belaboring this point. Here's a, photo, here's a photon wave function at the top of the screen. So let's again, I'll give myself a pointer. Psi mu nu, that's a bivector field. It's a pure field wave function. Now, here's my electron wave function. There's the alpha 0, 1, 2, alpha 3, z minus alpha 0, t. And I put an R omega in here, which I'll explain in a minute. I've got an R there as well. And the astonishing thing about that electron light wave function is if I multiply it by a field that represents a photon, by a photon field, e, and this one is EX plus BY with some strength given by this H0 term, this R is the eigenunity. You have to think about it being one, because if I'm going to multiply differentiate this thing, if that's not one, this is going to blow up. In fact, the omega here isn't, a, isn't an actual number. It's a, it's a thing that converts the alpha 3z and the alpha 0t to a phase. It's the remnants of kx minus omega t. So in fact, if you want to do this in SI units, you'd have a ct in here to make these things meters, and then that would be inverse meters, or you'd have a 1 over c, and that would be inverse time. Just, just the units of that, just a unit inverse time. So this thing's a unit object, and there's a unit object here as well. This is a photon wave function. It's a covariant wave function. But it's the photon wave function for all photons. If I want a different photon, I just change R. If I half R, I'll half the fields, and I'll half the frequency. I'll half the energy. This represents all photons from radio waves to gammas, the single parameter R. Now, another way you can think of R is that this thing itself has come from the derivative of a vector potential. So I have a vector potential with a number here, the R will come down. So I don't really like the notation here. While I was thinking about it, I'm thinking, well, I shouldn't have used, I need more explanation here. Uh, I know what I'm thinking here, but it's not particularly obvious I know that. But if you take this and expand it, what you'll find, to your utter astonishment, is although that thing contains mass and dual mass, P and Q terms, and E and B terms, contains field and mass. It's an electron-like wave function. When you pre-multiply it by perpendicular fields, perpendicular to the direction of transmission, EX, BY, trans angular momentum in Z, EX, BY, angular momentum in Z, propagation in Z. So these things have that triple of Z pho propagating photon transverse that you require from Maxwell's equations, as we know from from uh, solving Maxwell's equations many times and oft. Then the whole thing, the mass terms all cancel. If you, if you do the expansion, write them down, mass terms get plus and minus signs, they cancel, and you're left with a pure field object. That sign, hence, I can write this thing as sign you knew. So 
That's a photon wave function. It's a relativistic photon wave function. And it has a fixed angular momentum given by this H0 constant. If I change R, okay, the, the thing gets bigger, the wavelength gets bigger, but the energies get smaller commensurately, and the angular momentum remains the same of the circulation that's implied by the propagation of this thing. This is circulation alpha 0 t times alpha 0 1 2. Alpha 1 2 is a, a quaternion. It's something that turns things by a quarter. So, so what the thing does is you click forwards in time is it just rotates it. The thing has an angular momentum, and that angular momentum is fixed by H0, which of course is related to Planck's constant. That is a spin quantized relativistic photon wave function. written in absolute relativity within the williamson van der Mark theory. And it's quantized with a single scale parameter R. And I mean, it's a universal marker. That it sounds pretty it. cool. It's much more physical than, well, anyone else write down a fully relativistic photon wave function? Uh, I even get confused when I hear this uh, these words. So <laughs> I don't know where That's to fine. begin. No, no. I would, I would write down, you know, this, this, the, the oscillators and the, the, the yeah, I know, I second, second quantization and so on. I know, I know. Second, anyway, we, yeah. Okay, right. But John, not can I ask you something people. else? Uh, it's, it's, it's so far, it's, it's theory, uh, which is beautiful. Can you make an example? Like, let's calculate, I don't know, two photons bumping into each other, or Compton effect, or something else. Let's see what happens then. Yeah, of course you can, because the, you, you can calculate, well, there it is, two photons bump, you want two photons bumping into one another, there you go. And, right. wow, that's scary. <laughs> that's that's electron-positron pair creation. Yes, okay, can, and the, the, how does it compare with the, uh, let's say, the, the quantum field theory that we use? It's far better. In, yeah, I mean, field, in, the, in, the, in the prediction, can you make a prediction that is different than the tested, or... No, but the but the given one can't make a prediction. Where in where in given quantum field theory do you predict the electron charge? You put it in. You don't. I can how, no, but I'm not. I'm not saying about prediction of electron charge. Well, let's say what they can no, predict. Listen, listen, yeah. listen, listen. Yeah. You can calculate the charge from the spin in this theory. You well, don't have to put in the electron charge. You can calculate it. Okay. Seriously? Yes, seriously. Wow. It did That's it in nice. 1997. Paper, Martin, Martin and myself, paper 1997. So, so you, actually, you actually decrease the number of, let's say, yes. free parameters. You reduce the number the of free parameters. You can write the charge in terms of the spin or the spin in terms of the but charge. It's a, but it's yes. a huge success. A huge I know. Success. I was expecting a Nobel Prize long before now, but nobody seems <laughs> to have noticed. So, uh, so anyway, but there we go. One of those things. So but but wait a second. But, but, but wait a second. Can, can you make a prediction? Let's say I don't know this anomalous anom 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 uh, magnetic moment of electron or uh, same, paper. That... same paper, same paper, calculation. Wow. same paper. Yes, we can and did. Now, okay. Yes. So uh, so Williamson uh, van der Marek and Al Louis de Broglie, uh, 1997 is up on the web, so you can download it. Okay. okay right. Good. So where was I? I've lost myself now. Okay, we're at the photon. There's a photon wave function. But, but I, I want to talk about I want to get on to talking about engineering. So I'll need to go a little bit quicker. But look, the thing is that one needs to realize what quantization is. Now, the way we do quantization, the way I learned quantization at school, at a university rather, post grad, CERN, where I, where I was trained, is that you put you have a bunch of quantum numbers, and those quantum numbers there are lots of them. In uh, current in the standard model, there are about 40. So, so forget first and second quantization. You have third, fourth, fifth, sixth, tenth, thirteenth, twenty-fourth quantization. I'll do a few of them. You need to understand what quantization is. First quantization first is a phase coherence. It comes about in the Bohr model of the atom because when you go around by one loop, you have one full wavelength. That's first quantization. Second quantization is is creation and inhalation is in spin space. It's spin quantization. Charge quantization, as I said, you can calculate from the spin quantization, but it's in topology in electric field space. Flux quantization is in magnetic field space. Mass quantization has to do with the pivot and quetch hog, the mass terms, and their interaction throughout all of space. So the fine structure constant is a measure of what the likelihood is of finding something somewhere that you can interact with. That's um, 
that's um, uh, Williamson and Van der Mark, but it's other people as well. We're not the only ones to have noticed that. Just a minute. I think um, I heard it as well from uh, one of our fellow Martin the other day, at least something similar. Now, <clears throat> but there are lots more. There are, there are all the lepton numbers, you know, the quantum numbers, the quarks, the gluons, all this sort of thing. The lepton number you can take as being the vorticity, if you like, uh, quanta uh, conservation of, of, of the double loopedness of the fermion, of, of the electron fermion. But in order to have a, a quantum state, you don't just, it's not just one kind of quantization. They all got to match. They all have to be coherent. They all have to go around, they can go around the loop. One can go around twice, another can go around three times, another can go around once, provided they all come back and are in phase so that they reform one another. You have something which is recurring. You need a recurrence, a recurrence, to have a self-creating object, a particle. So, so, so you need to have a, a quantization in all of these spaces. Now, I've talked about the space. I've said, look, the, 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 the dynamical spaces here, there are four three spaces. There are four three spaces here. Four three spaces. Look, one, two, three, four. These are all electric field space, magnetic field space, space space, and spin space. These are four different three spaces. They're not, uh, they're three spaces. They're not four spaces. They all have to be coherent. You have to have coherence in three space, coherence in magnetic field space, coherence in magnetic fields, electric field space, and spin space. All have to cohere. You have multiple phases. And provided those phases are integer number of two pi or four pi for fermions, all of them, you have a coherence. You could have a particle. So this is just a proof of the linearity of field and energy that both can be linear. The only way to make it both linear is to, in space and time, is to deform space and time according to special relativity. I've talked about this before. The key equation here is that if you have light in a box which has which bounces backwards and forwards, then the relativistic correction gamma is one over square root one minus v squared over c squared is exactly the same as a half r plus one over r, where r is the redshift is that I talked about before. This this different. Because if you, if you move, if you if you have a green photon in a box and move it, blue going one way and red going the other way, that this, blue gives you more energy than the red loses because the red can only go down to zero when the blue can go to infinity. And that proportion is just the gamma factor, exactly. And all of that linearizes energy and root energy. That's, what relativity, that's where relativity comes from. It's uh, nothing to do with rulers and clocks, really. It's to do with the physics of something being linear, of bilinearity, of dual linearity. Anyway, prof, this stuff is in, uh, I've done this analysis in a paper in 2019. So if you want to look at the full maths there, you can look at that paper. Um, inversion, I've just, Martin and I just published a paper, Division Inversion and Scalar Invariance, which showed where dynamics come from. The important thing about this is that the inverse of a vector, for example, you, not surprising, is a vector. It's a vector in the opposite direction. Um, and it's scaled by, as will not surprise you, by the invariant interval. Vector scale, so a big vector scale, by an invariant interval. F here's the inverse of a field, and a field transforms to a field. Uh, I've also included the, the, um, the, the, the scalar part here as you would expect again, but it's more complicated, that, uh, that, that inversion. And here's a general formula for that inversion. But it's inversions that are driving the dynamics. A differential operator is a special kind of inversion. And if you're inverting a complete thing, you have to not only invert the field. If you're inverting a field, you have to have an inversion, which is an inversion of the field to form a scalar, to have a mass exchange from A to B. You need to both invert the field and invert the field distribution. And circles do that. So simple objects are what you need. Charge quantization, well, the way charge quantization arises is because the topology gives you a charge, which you can calculate, 1997 paper. But, um, but if we think about charge in physics, you have two kinds of charge. You have the charge in electromagnetism, which is a generator of electric field. And you have the charge in quantum electrodynamics, which is uh, the probability of an exchange photon, which is given by the fine structure constant alpha. They're proportional to one another. The present theory shows why, because if you look at the base equation, let's go back to the base equation, you'll see that when you add 
let's just find the base equation. There it is. That's this first equation here. There's the divergence of field. That's the charge. You've got another term, which is the rate of change of mass. That's Maxwell, Maxwell charge, divergence of electric field. That's quantum electrodynamics, exchange of mass, mass energy exchange. The two things are equal to each other up to a sign. So this theory unifies quantum electrodynamics with uh, Maxwell theory in a very nice way. That was like, okay, inversion, charge quantization. If you want to turn light into matter, this is the subject of the 97 paper, which has the G minus two calculation in it as well, Russell, especially. Then you form this thing, which is the Martin, Martin drew this, um, electron photon vortex. So topology hedgehogs the photon field, which is spinning in a spiral. But if you spin that spiral and make it bite its own tail, then the electric field is hedgehogged out to a charge field. Photon field, it remains outward directed, but it's now outward directed over a spherical distribution, not over a, uh, not a, not a, not a cylindrical one as in the photon. That gives you a charge. And you can calculate that charge, and the charge is the elementary charge, pretty much, as, as was done in the 97 paper. So here's the whole thing. Theory on the right. Electron. You can't just form an electron from a photon. You need to form these things in pairs because vorticity is conserved. So you need to form an electron positron pair. Here's the process of electron Yeah, but isn't it, uh, John, I'm sorry, but isn't it uh, simple energy and, and, and momentum conservation? You, you cannot convert photon into electron without violating those two laws, can you? Yes, you can. And if you have positronium, it decays to two photons or three photons, depending on whether it's in the north or a para state. Oh, sorry, I, I meant you cannot, uh, I mean, you cannot convert photon into, wait, uh, what was so I saying? There are two photons here. Not, you can't convert one photon into energy, but you can convert two or three. Right. But, but you just said that uh, because there will be some vorticity violated. Um, but no, no, uh, I always thought that, yeah? One? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's not just vorticity; it's also momentum. You're quite right. So okay, okay, all right. Okay, okay. but, 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 but oh, electron. Always understood. Yeah. Okay. Right. Good. But but um, but the point is that if a, if you create some vorticity, if you create a, an electron, a photon vortex, which is an electron, if you create an electron, you can't uncreate it because vorticity is is conserved. So so what happens is two. And that is basically charge. This is basically charge. That's a charge. So yeah, that's two so photons within. Like one of, one of them forms a loop with the electric field pointing outwards, that's a positron. Mm -hmm. The other forms a loop with the electric field pointing inwards. All of these things mm -hmm. have to, each detailed thing has to be conserved. So you have to have right. a loop and an anti-loop, an electron yes. and a positron, a charge and an charge, charge neutral in, charge out, a spin and an anti-spin, spin zero in, spin zero out for two photons, mm -hmm. spin one for three photons, et cetera, et cetera. You need, to, you need to, there are a set of conservation laws, which are the standard conservation laws, which one must follow. But this thing obeys all of them. Your charges here are just uh, are basically uh, topological uh, properties. They're topological the field. charges, yes. Yeah, they're topological right. charges. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're basically topological. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, can you so, then uh, explain, uh, imagine, uh, sorry, um, uh, maybe, uh, I, I, I feel like you're onto something. <laughs> and that's really, it's a huge thing. Well, listen, right? I hope you know. I'm onto something. Having, having given 40 years of my life to it, I'd really rather I was onto something. No, oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, but I'm just, uh, you know, um, understand me as well. Uh, for me, it's very new, so I need to understand that first, and uh, hopefully not within 40 years, but faster. <laughs> Um, well, uh, there are a whole set of papers for which the references are here, and you will have access to the slides as well. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah this we'll is, go on this then. is stuff I've talked about at length in previous talks, so I don't want to. I want to get on to talking about engineering with these things. Sure. Yeah. Go on. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Okay. So that's the detail thing here. Um, people have seen it before. Um, this is the quantum bicycle motion. Now, this is a quantum state drawn in momentum space in the outer loop. The inner, the inner loop is in the other three-dimensional space. Uh, uh, let, let me just, okay, so, so, so these are some solutions in the, of this new theory. So the solutions are what? The solutions are, you have a new theory, the new theory has new solutions. First solution is a fully relativistic photon solution. So if you, if you, do, if you do d mu, psi mu, nu on that object, then that equals zero. That's, that, this is, that is a solution of Maxwell's equations. But any length scale. And that's easy to show as well. It's just, again, a few lines. 
So um, then there's another solution, that's this one, photon going round round in circles. That's also a solution. It's a solution because you have a pivot term here, you create mass. This is a twisted mode structure. And that mass term produces a momentum which is perpendicular to the pointing vector. And you have a resonance if that uh, momentum is the same as the pointing vector, and then the thing goes round and round in circles in a double loop. So and that's an electron. So that's another solution of not the Maxwell's equations, obviously, but of the full equations, d mu psi g equals zero. Uh, that, that wave function is a solution of d mu psi g equals zero. Right. So, but let's have a look. Here, here this is, you can do, one can do too much maths, and I don't want to get too stuck on the maths because the maths is still under development, and maths is anyway nothing. Uh, it's just marks on paper. So I want to do this in terms of a diagram. When you do a differential, there are three kinds, three sorts of differentials in, in Maxwell's equations. There's the divergence or the gradient, grad, div or grad operator. There's the curl operator, and there's d by dt. And you have a balance between them in the different equations. d by dt here are the sort of um, are the, are the greater than or less than signs, the arrow heads. The divergence and gradient are given by solid arrows, and the curl is given by curly arrows. These are the different transformations that one has in the, in the in, in the full equations. So these are the allowed transformations for the vector differential. And if you want to have a look at what's happening in a photon, when in a photon you have electric and magnetic field, but if I look at it at the detail of the transformation first differential level, if I, if, if I want to do a solution of the photons, as we know, we go to the second differential level. But if you want to, to say, and, and if one's describing this in complex numbers, you say it's, 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 uh, it's uh, uh, a field and then it's elsewhere, and then it's a field and then it's elsewhere. It's somewhere complex. But here, you don't have the luxury of complexity. You have, here it goes from a field to a vector potential, a magnetic field, vector potential, to an electric field, to a spin. And of course, a photon carries one unit of angular momentum. Eigen, the eigen uh, momentum of a photon in high-energy physics experiments is always h bar, it's always one. So it's a, it's a spin one object goes around this loop. So also, this is, circles here are one object, triangles are a three object. This is the three components of electric field, the three components of magnetic field, the three components of space, x, y, z, and the three components of spin. Spin x, spin around x, spin around y, spin axial vector, well, x is an axial tri vector spin around x, spin around y, spin around z. So 0, j, k is the z, is the x direction of 0, 1, 2 is the 3 direction, the z direction of the spin. And these circles are single objects. That's time, that's mass energy, that's dual mass energy, and that's the hedgehog, an interesting one, uh, directed volume element. So they, they run around these loops. Ob and, and the idea is that objects fold into you. So you have a two-dimensional object like the magnetic field. Under a differential operation, that folds out to a spin along this orange arrow. So you have a 2D thing that folds out to a box, that folds out to a three-dimensional object. Or vice versa, the 3D folds into 2D, folds by one object. It also folds from a three-dimensional object to another three-dimensional object. That three dimensions is part of a six component object. So, so you have these, these motions around these loops, but they, here you have six, here you have four, time and space, here you have one, one, four, six, four, one. So you, you go up in number of these objects, but of course these are single component. The component has to be somewhere, z direction of spin, for example, if this thing is zero, one, two. But, but they go around these loops and, and uh, each one of these things must be resonant and harmonic. You have to have something which is for spin transforming to magnetic field, there must be something else which transforms, uh, which, which will be the vector potential, which transforms, uh, which will be the electric field, which is transforming to give you the spin. Otherwise, the, the object is, well, doesn't necessarily have to be, it has to return after four differentiations, but, uh, but, it, but it has to have a path to return. So um, if we're talking about what these things are physically, you must take this too, too literally, you could take time to be a frequency, a vibration in, in um, well, time, time is more frequency than time, uh, whereas uh, 
this is a linear de deformation. The space you can imagine the uh, vector potential as being a linear deformation, the fabric of space time. The magnetic field is kind of like a twist in the fabric of space time. Um, the electric field is a space time twist. The hedgehog is like a breather in space time, in or out. The spin is like something that's moving and simultaneously turning around a perpendicular vector. So, so, it's, so it's like a like a, a tied vortex. It's like a vortex which is which is tied to these other objects, tied by the equations to lo to a locality, tied by the bookends of mass to a locality. So there's spin in there, but the spin's not going anywhere in the, in the electron. It's, it's well, it is going round round in circles, but it's not. It, it's tied into the thing. So that's the kind of transformations you have within the maths and the physics of these things. So look, really, you have four spaces. You have a base space, which is frequency space, free, spatial frequency or temporal frequency. You have the electric field space, which guess what? Looks just like electric field space that you know and love. So those diagrams are just the ones from any textbook. <clears throat> you have a magnetic field space, which is, guess what? Just the magnetic field. This is the vector potential space, if you like. Or, but uh, it's actually time and space space. We're talking about frequency space here. We're talking about energy space. Frequency is energy in some sense. But then you have a space which you're unfamiliar with, and that space is spin space. And that's what I want to say something about here. Spin space. Spin space, the spin in Z is entirely not in Z. Spin in Z is spin in the XYT volume. XYT, it's, an, it's like an axial, it's like a magnetic field. A magnetic field in the Z direction is really um, in the XY plane. It's an axial vector. So spin in Z is an XY, an XTY thing. Spin in Z is an XYT thing. It's alpha zero, um, one, two direction. Now, the thing is, these spins, th this is a completely unfamiliar space. This is quantum spin space. This is a spin field. It's not a spin that's actually something going round and round. It's spinning this happening over a volume. And that spinning this happens over a volume, if you start integrating it, it's just going to give you something around the outside of the volume. But if you want to integrate the spin in x, in, z, in t, x, y space, the proper integral of that, if I want to integrate that, is to integrate over z. So integrate, it, it's a z spin, I need to integrate over z. If you do a proper integral over z, you introduce the z dimension, which means you integrate the three space spin to the one space quedge hog. And the integral spin space is a one space. This is part of why quantum spin is so peculiar. It's in a one dimensional space, not a three dimensional space. When you integrate this stuff up, because it's a spin field, not an actual spin of something going round and round in circles, like an electron going round on a string or something. So if you do the proper integral of that, the proper integral, the absolute relativistic in integral of that, you're going to end up with something in a one space. That's why quantum spin is so peculiar. It's at least part of why quantum spin is so peculiar. The other part, of course, is that it's quantized. We've come, well, we dealt with that for the photon, but we can do it for the electron as well. Um, either, as I said to Russell earlier, you've reduced the number of parameters by one. You can either calculate charge in terms of spin or spin in terms of charge. One still has to deal with the one that remains, of course, but that's quite a big step forward. So, so here's spin space. And the thing about spin space is, in engineering, spins are coherent. And if you start making things like magnetic materials, then you're doing that by, well, it's not just engineering. I mean, ions magnetic by itself. But if you want to engineer a supermagnet, you need to understand what you're doing in quantum spin space. And because you don't have a tool to think about it until now, um, that can be difficult. This is where the engineering starts to come in. We've already long time been able to en engineer in energy space, in electric field space, in magnetic field space. Now you can start to try thinking in spin space as well. And spins cohere. If you have a couple of spins, one on top of each other, they can share each other's spinningness. If you go to the fractional quantum Hall fluid, one is sharing actual magnetic fields, which are a twist, which is a phase change. Some people think these are anionic statistics, but in fact, what you've got is you've got a sum statistic, which is still fermionic when you have a quantum Hall state. And there's an argument about this, I know, between Lockyer wave functions and, and Halperin's approach and so forth. But this is just 
it looks like an absolutely puerile argument to me, thinking in terms of spin space, because they don't have the space to think in. So you're looking in some weird gauge space that you have to look into to look at these things by analogy. It's much better to look in the real space, which is the real space of field space. Anyway, um, Ani and I have just have written a paper about this, and we're, it's out for consultation at the moment before we, before we submit it. And these diagrams are due to Ani, of course. I can't draw diagrams as beautiful. So thanks, Ani. How much time have I taken so far? I've taken about an hour and a half, haven't I? I should really kind of wind up a bit, shouldn't I? Let's 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 just put these things up so they're on the recording. This is the exclusion principle. Exclusion principle is a thing, you know. It's stated as a principle. Thou shalt not put two things in the same quantum state. And then why not? Okay, something to do with the symmetry of the wave function. It has to be totally unsymmetric. That's a load of bollocks. It's a force. If you, if you actually start scattering, high energy scattering, spin polarized protons off one another, you see there's an enormous force going on, stronger than the strong interaction. Uh, O'Fallon et al. Fisrev, 1977. I mean, that's before some of you were born. And and, and it, it, it actually clobbers the quark parton model. Just read it. Krish has a nice explanation, scientific American, May 1979, but it's really a strong force. Why is it a strong force? Try and put two things in the same state. They interfere with one another constructively. The field's doubled everywhere. Energy goes as field squared. The energy goes, two electrons coming together will have four electrons of mass. Four electrons of mass is a very strong repulsive force. That's the Pauli exclusion principle. It's not a principle. It's a, it's, it's it's field interference. It's a force. It's I'm sorry. I, I, uh, that's, no, don't, uh, worry, don't, don't worry, Kristen. I don't have time to. I'll, I'll come back to okay. that if you want to ask a question. Yeah. If, you, if you can send me, maybe later, you can just send me out. Know, uh, I'm not going to send like... anybody papers. It's all in literature. The, um, the, the spin right. force is uh, is 2012. Actually, I should, I should write it down. Yeah. Okay, okay, I should. I should. Go it's on, 2012 yeah. Siemens Mendel. Anyway, it's, 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 it, it, it's on my web page, okay? You can, put, you can download them from there. Right. So, now, okay, here we go. The di boson, the di electron boson, spin into weaving. This is the inner shell of, of helium that I talked about at the beginning. This is a new state of matter. It's not really an electron. It's not really two electrons. It is two, made of two electrons, but it's a boson. Spin up, spin down. It's a it's a coherence of two electrons, actually in these spaces, interweaving through one another, so that the spin field is everywhere zero. Not the spin. The total spin is zero. That's a boson, right? But it's not a boson at the level of you know one spin minus one spin. It's everywhere in detail zero spin. This is an incredibly strong coherence that's nothing to do with energy. This is a better description of the thing we call a Cooper pair. If you get a Cooper pair, you have to do quantum mechanics, then you have to do the quantum mechanics of quantum mechanics if you want to go to PCS theory. That's awfully primitive. Much better is to think in terms of spin space and the interweaving of these things. And also, it is known experimentally, Tate et al., and this is 1990, it's not quite as old as the Fallon et al. thing, that the mass of Cooper pairs is more than twice than the mass of ele two electrons. They were measuring these things, and um, there's the reference. And they're expecting the thing to be bound, which means two electrons should have slightly less mass. Anyway, what they found instead is that it had a greater mass. So instead of it being x down, it was 10x up in mass. So these things don't, these are coherences that don't need to be energetically bound. That's, that's a new state of matter. It's the dielectron boson. Uh, I'll skip spherical harmonics because everybody knows what they are. Uh, no, I won't. I won't quite skip it. it. We all know how to do spherical harmonics. It's one of the things we learned in third year at university. And you get these very nice things which chemists use, all these nice shapes with sort of X, Y, Z or R, theta, phi stuff. Um, let me just play this a little bit so we get some animation here going. Okay, so there's some spherical harmonics for you. Here they are in X, Y, Z space. It, um, and down in the right-hand corner, there are... Uh, they're just playing in uh, in in, in R theta phi space, but you know they're very nice. You can calculate them, but they never happen in reality. Why not? Because real atoms, the electrons in them, pop out in carbon, for example, into a tetrahedral form. Obviously, because they repel one another, 
and they form bonds in a tetrahedral form. The, the structure of molecules and crystals is not spherical harmonic. It's bent from these things by reality. These are bent by reality. The maths isn't nice, but uh, reality is what you get. And so Arnie and I are having a look at how these bendings take place. And here are some diagrams from that. I just want to share with you one of these, which is the oxygen molecule, which is this one down here. The oxygen molecule is a beautiful kind of double dumbbell thing, two oxygens with three hydrogens in a dumbbell shape on each side. So there are kind of six electrons that contribute to a spin, and they do. Oxygen is ridiculously paramagnetic. It's a paramagnetic gas. The physics of magnetism, the engineering of magnetism, is best thought about in spin space and spin coupled space. That's the, the ground state of this is L equals one, it's spin one. And, uh, and, and hence it's paramagnetic spin and magnetic field are related to one another through those um, differential things that I showed earlier. If you go to crystals, if you want to engineer crystals, the electron wave function expands to fill the whole crystal in harmonic modes. That's just ordinary quantum mechanics. The, the biggest electron in a copper bar is twice the size of the copper bar. And you can measure this sort of thing. And I have measured this stuff in Phillips and Eindhoven when we still had an advanced theoretical experimental physics group. And the best, the best measuring, uh, well, the best experimental setup in the world at the time, simply. One of the things I measured there was having a look at the electron wave function, the distribution of charge. And the things are big. An electron in, in a two-dimensional electron gas is 40 nanometers across. Uh, but of course, they get bigger than that. <clears throat> these states are resonant, harmonic, coherent quasi-particles. And quasi-electrons have electron, the electron topology, but they're bigger than atoms. They exist in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a background sea of many, many, many atoms in a symmetry that's defined by the symmetry of that crystal. These are coherent harmonic systems in big quasi-particles. And if one wants to go to more advanced quasi-particles like the fractional quantum ball state, one needs to think in terms of mixed states of electromagnetism and matter. You need a properly relativistic theory to think about these things at all. Otherwise, you're stuck with some crappy maths. So let's talk about some collective coherent states of matter that one could think about. The dielectron boson we've had, it's a fill spin zero shell or a Cooper pair. Electro proton, that's hydrogen. But, but hydrogen is not an electron and a proton only. It's an electro proton. It's two spin states. It could be para hydrogen or ortho hydrogen. Two hydrogen nuclei can be can be uh, uh, in the same direction or a different direction. And it, it, in the what you're breathing in at the moment is three quarters ortho and one quarter para because these things thermalize. The nuclear spin here is such a big energy that if you just liquefy hydrogen, half of it will boil off because there's enough energy as also drops down to the lower para state to, to, to boil the hydrogen off. You, you, when you liquefy these things, you have to get rid of the ortho stuff, otherwise you lose half your hydrogen. Anyway, electro-proton is a, is, a, is, a, is a mixed state of electron and proton where two things have the same de Broglie wavelength. The proton in hydrogen is also 10 to the minus 10 meters de Broglie as is the electron, only, only, this is only, this only works for hydrogen, but other, other things, of course, start to shrink down with some effect of that as well. There's also the electro new proton, the neutron. These things decay to an electron and a proton with a neutrino as well. And neutrons are unstable, except in, if they're in a larger coherence like helium. And helium's a tri boson. So it's a proton boson, it's a neutron boson, and it's an electron boson. Very, very beautiful, very strongly bound very coherent system. Beryllium-8 decays in 10 to the minus 17 seconds to two heliums. It's, it, 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 things want to be helium. Then dioxygen we've talked about, it's spin one, it's paramagnetic. This is a coherence. Then you have electro-trifermions, or you might call them electro-trianions, depending on whether you follow the anion, which have never been measured, or fermions, which are all over the place fractional quantum ball quasi-particle. Also, what about snowflakes? What about them being resonant, collective, coherent states of matter? They're beautifully symmetric, aren't they? Well, maybe. So, 
uh, I was talking about the superconducting boson being a dielectron, so that's that. And here's the reference for the Tate anomaly, uh, both, both good references for the Tate anomaly and the numbers. You expected a binding of 0.99592 uh, of the uh, dielectron mass. You got 1.4 electrons, eight, four, four zeros, eight. So, so, so how's that bound if it's unbound? Well, it's bound because of the spin coherence in Williamson van der Mark theory and not in anything else. So let's go back to playing these things and we'll play the conclusions and that's me. So the conclusions, right. First of all, there's a new relativistic quantum mechanics, which is apt for engineering. We're beginning to engineer at least chemical engineering, this sort of thing. Of course, physical engineering comes next. The theory extends the Maxwell equation. It generalizes Dirac, so it treats the mass in a more sophisticated way. And it turns out to underpin QED and it calculates the charge. Come on, calculate the fine structure constant. There you go, one of them, and G minus two. The new paradigm allows thinking into areas that were otherwise completely inaccessible to thought at all. It has four superimposed dynamical three spaces which construct the world around us. I didn't really talk about it, but the space you're sitting next to and the space on which my computer is sitting, the table here, is a three-dimensional table, not a four-dimensional table. And it's three dimensions of electric field, mostly, that form the physical table, which I'm looking at. It was a steel table that had three dimensions of magnetic. It's also got spinning bits in it. If it's got any uh, iron in it, there'll be spinning bits in there. And of course, it's also defined by the three dimensions of space, as is usual, so I can project it into space. Well, there are four of those three spaces for physical objects, not just one. And this is why the universe looks so very three-dimensional, not four-dimensional at all. But there are also four 1D spaces, one of which is time, another which is mass energy, the root mass energy, another which is dual root mass energy, and the other one is the hedgehog. These things confine and parameterize and constrain the others because the others flow through them. So they, 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 they fix massive particles in place. They are invariant. Well, uh, two of them are invariant. Uh, the others are uh, covariant. The other 1D space are covariant. They're not orthovariant, the 1D spaces, that's the fields. Fields are special fields, then space and time. So the simple map is simply bent by reality in atoms, molecules, and crystals into the shapes that we know and love in terms of diamonds and everything else. And the idea is to take this and start implementing particle physics to chemistry. So solid state physics. Um, I'm very keen to do that, having worked in the field before. Materials and device engineering, likewise, I've done lots of this stuff too. So I'd like to get into that, but I don't want to do all this myself. I need a team of people who are enthusiastic about doing this kind of thing. But, so this is really, a, really just the start. And that's the end of the talk. So. Thank you very much, John. I'll try and stop sharing. Sharing, stopping. I'll oh, stop share there. Oh, yeah. Of course. Get myself a cursor. There we are. Right. Well, Hello, thank everyone. you very much, Sean, for this fantastic story. I must say, I'm only scratching the surface myself for understanding, but um, it's all very, it's all very, very new. So, um, so, so, so uh, I mean, a lot of you guys have seen some of this stuff before. So, so it's it, this is pretty much the only group where I could talk to some people who actually know a little bit of the history of this. So, uh, so for everybody else, it's even worse if that's any if that's any consolation. So yeah, it's not a you don't get a new relativistic quantum mechanics coming along every day. So, uh, so uh, it's quite a quite a big thing if it's right. And of course, that's down to experiment and whether that says anything about how stuff really works. So we'll hey, John. In, yeah. in the audience, we have uh, we have uh, three people that are aware of these developments already for almost forty years. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, such an honor. Dick, I love Dick. I love Dick Yuri is a me. Yeah. So Dick Yuri is a me. Were, were there uh, right from the beginning? Uh, Gentlemen, it's always a pleasure to see you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but all the time I wondered, uh, John. Uh, so. If you are so much convinced that this is the correct theory, then why don't you manage to convince other people? Well, um, I think um, one has to remember that, uh, well, okay, first of all, maybe I'm just wrong. 
that's, that's, the, that's, that's, that's the first thing. Perhaps, you know, I can be convinced about that, but you're right, convincing other people is a different thing. Secondly, I'm not very good at lots of things. And uh, one of them is I'm not particularly good at organization. And another one is I'm not very good at maths. So Martin was much better at maths than I, than I am. So if you're wanting to persuade people, um, so in the beginning we had the, um, the um, 97 paper, which was based on semi-classical thinking. It was at the level of Bohr model 1913 kind of physics. Now that doesn't look very impressive to somebody who's doing stuff in gauge theory or string theory or extremely advanced mathematics, which again itself may or may not be correct. But that, that just doesn't register as being a possibility for the way stuff works, I think. One needs to go to proper theory. Now I realized that, and it wasn't until 2014 that I wrote down the wave function, uh, I wrote down the, um, the, um, the new uh, uh, equations and the wave functions that I'm talking about, what we call the gold standard wave function for the relativistic photon. But I think it's so unfamiliar, people think, I think people think that it can't be done, that this is not possible. But also, you have to find something where people think there's a problem. And I think that the world doesn't think there's a problem here. The world thinks that everything is understood as the world thought everything was understood in 1895. And that the only detail left was filling in, the, filling in a few points here and there. People have also got used to not understanding stuff. People think it's perfectly okay to have an uncertainty relation when you don't know what's happening in some phase. They think it's absolutely fine to postulate things like many worlds or faster than light or all uh, sorts that, of uh, I, I, That cannot be the reason because uh, in parallel uh, to what you have been doing, uh, other people uh, develop theories like string theory, which is, I would say, mathematically and conceptually uh, even more complex, but they somehow manage to convince other people. So what, what, what is different? What is different? Well, the thing is, they don't really manage to con that convince other people because in string <laughs> theory, there isn't one string theory. And, you know, uh, people like Will Steck are saying things like, you know, not even wrong. Uh, but also the string theorists, each, pretty much every single, there are as many string theories, pretty much, as there are string theorists. Uh, uh, as soon as a PhD leaves his mentor, he starts doing something different with it. I did uh, maybe, talk to... maybe that's true, but, but uh, your theory, so suppose that it would be correct. And uh, your, uh, so the Williams and Vandermark theory uh, has the ability to make quantitative predictions. Yes. While a string theory maybe also can do it, but it is not verifiable. Well, the thing is that string theory pretty much doesn't, that, that's the beauty of string theory. It doesn't predict anything, so it can't be experimental. <laughs> Yeah, but, but in your case, it would be possible. So I think yes. what, what, what you might try is uh, just predict the outcome of an experiment that people can really perform. So I have first been done yet, right? If, if your theory is complete, then you should be able to predict. Uh, if people run, uh, let's say, a search for a Higgs boson, then you should be able to predict where they should find a resonance. Yeah, yeah. So, so John, in other words, uh, can, can, can your, your approach shed some light on whether the standard model is indeed complete or there are still, uh, say, uncertain territories that you, you have no access to and could predict the uh, outcome of experiments that have not been done? I think that's almost also what you're, you're saying, Franz. Yes, indeed. Yes, that's, yes. That's right, Julius. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But you see, the thing is that the, the situation at the moment with the standard model is there are many, many experiments. I could name 10 which contradict parts of the standard model. And I've presented some of them just now. But people have got used to that. They've got used to the quark model not working for spins. They've got used to quarks not being fermions. They've got used no, to... I, I don't think that they got used because people try to uh, to develop theories beyond the standard model. And yes, they're also they're running they're... experiments to detect these anomalies. That's right. But, yeah, but yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's the way around. Uh, first, you do the experiment, you miss something, and then you, you, you try to adapt your theory. Uh, but in, in your theory, John, you, you could make predictions on something which is beyond the horizon of the standard model at the moment. That, 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 that's right. And well, one of those was just here. One of those was the explanation of the Tate anomaly. 
the prediction is that the coherence extends to unbound states uh, in, in superconductivity. But I think, um, and, and in my last paper, I made a whole series of um, experimental proposals. There's an experimental, I'm working with a couple of people from NASA at the moment, and one of the things is to look at ortho and para hydrogen in space. The thing is that on Earth, it's three quarters ortho and one quarter para. But in space, when it forms, if you get a couple of hydrogens wandering in relatively high energies, they pretty much all form para. <clears throat> That's a bit weird, but I can explain why, because you have a spin coherence for the para thing. So what you have is you have, like, well, you, you have a, co a coherence for, 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 these, uh, for these two. Hydrogens, of course, are uh, charge zero, so there's no... There's no electromagnetic force between them. There's a gravitational force between them. But over a short range, over a medium range, there'll be another force between them, which is intermediate in strength between electromagnetic and magnetic in the Williamson van der Meyer theory. It would produce a coherence which gave you parahydrogen, so you could do a parahydrogen experiment. The other thing is, uh, I think that where I want to move to is to not necessarily just doing experiments, but doing engineering, proof by engineering, you know, think of a new superconductor, how a superconductor should be constructed, and make it. Make, make a room temperature superconductor. Understand how superconductivity works and what you need to do to make a room temperature superconductor and, 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 and make it. Um, yeah, that would probably be sufficient if you can. <laughs> <I'll do it. laughs> but yeah, I think that would be sufficient. And uh, then people could get convinced, yes. Yeah, well, the other thing is, I want to go into the magnetism as well. Yeah, go on, Julius. Could you also Sorry. test the, the, the issue of, of, of dark matter? Because there is, yes. there is yes. moths that yes. we cannot see, but which we yes. can. Yes, I, I've given uh, a couple of talks on, on the nature of dark matter. Yes. And uh, yeah, in, in fact, um, if you want, uh, if, you, if you're not being completely bored by this, I can give another Fanart and talk about the nature of dark matter. Um, I've, I've given it to several university groups already, uh, before COVID, prior to COVID, but yes. Um, so, John, in that case, please add some slides on, on some practical experiments that you might want to do to prove uh, okay. uh, the dark if you look matter. In the papers, if you look in the 2019 paper, which is referenced in the slides I've already given, there are a bunch of experiments in that. Oh, right. Uh, one of the experiments I want to do is with, um, is with lasers. Because I think that if you take lasers, so it's another experiment you could do is take two lasers, put them in a twisted mode. So right circularly polarized on right circularly polarized. The overlap of the um, photon wave functions there has pointing back to zero because as the two things come in, the electric and magnetic fields are parallel because they're, they're traveling in opposite directions. So this is known in, in, la uh, in laser circles as a twisted mode thing where pointing vector is everywhere and for all time zero. So light comes in and it stops. So that is the precursor state for electron positron pair formation. So I propose to say, okay, get that in a high intensity laser, laser on laser, and then take a test laser perpendicular to that. And you should, it, it should be deflected. You should see interference. Yeah, how, see how, 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 how good vacuum would you need? Because you do not want to have any matter there. Um, you don't want any matter there. You're right. Quite a good fact. It's, I'm not saying it's an easy experiment. I mean, you, you know, as you, you, you know, you, 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 you know, as um, from, 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 from old, of course, and uh, you know how much effort we put into doing experiments. I, I know this one's going to be hard. Yes. But and some of these experiments are hard. The, 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 the ortho and para hydrogen one's even worse for vacuum considerations. You really do need a seriously high vacuum. You need you know, a few hydrogens per cubic meter, you know, that's really going to be seriously difficult to produce on Earth. Yeah, so, but probably you need the universe as, 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 as your lab. Yeah, that's yeah, right. You need to be yeah, there in yeah and then not the universe close to Earth. Now, yeah. then you should propose it as an experiment for a deep space, a, a deep space probe. I'm, I'm talking to a couple of guys from NASA, to Brian, Brian, Drew, I should have mentioned his name. He was on one of the slides. But um, we've got, I've got a regular Friday meeting at the moment with a couple of guys from NASA about Brian Druin's one of them is at JPL NASA. Uh, another guy is M Michael Mercury, and this is a, seriously his name. He's a, <laughs> obviously, um, anyway, he's turning into a good friend. We, we, 
Ali and I are chatting to him every Friday, and we'll be talking to him next Friday. Last week, I proposed the interaction I just said, and that could be turned into an experiment. He's looking for some 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 vehicle to um, to do exciting shit stuff, and this one's an exciting thing, of course, to do. But there are other things as well. I think we can make a power source. I think that it might be possible to produce a very, very potent power source. And I think some people might be doing this already. So there's this Sapphire group who a lot of people think are completely crazy. And uh, there, there are some very, very vehement and vitriolic attacks on this group in, in on the web. And th I'm afraid this is what's going to happen to me. This is my faith. If people start taking it seriously. The first thing is everybody's going to shout at me. So, um, so, um, but they've been transmuting matter. They've been producing uh, materials that weren't there in the thing before from a plasma reactor. And I think that what they're doing is they are um, they're creating matter. And I, I think that um, they're doing something very dangerous as well because they're doing this in a plasma reactor and they're sitting literally in a container next to it, playing with the creation of nuclear particles. You know, it's like Madame Curie, except there's six of them in the bloody box with a thing a, a few meters away. This is extremely dangerous. So I phoned them up and told them that, you know, they had to do stuff and told them what they needed to do. They needed to put a thermometer in there. And if they saw a thermometer going down in temperature, uh, they had to run like hell. So, um, so because I think this thing would suck energy out of locality. Uh, so I think they might be actually doing matter creation. You know, the universe exists. It's full of matter. Something's got to create matter, right? And the big band is bollocks, basically, and has proven to be bollocks. And I mean, there being absolutely nothing and then there being an enormous explosion is completely ridiculous. It's worse than any of the creation myths of any of the major religions. Just read them. They're better, all of them. So, um, so there has to be some mechanism to create matter. And, uh, well, I think I know how to do it. So that's another experiment to propose, but not just an experiment. That's not an experiment you want to write down because that kind of thing is something that you really would like good people to be developing, not, 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 um, well, not the Taliban anyway. So John, how, how many orders of magnitude of energy do you need compared to what's available now in, in high power lasers or something? How many, how much more energy do you need to do this? Do you need 10 uh, orders more you, or is it just available, do you think? No, no, the material, Julius was absolutely right about high vacuum here because you don't want any matter spoiling this stuff. But uh, it's actually not that bad because you, you can modulate it so you could turn the laser on and off. If you flash the laser, you'll see a, an AC signal, of course. So, yeah. so you can do things about, but but, um, but the, the typical field density in hydrogen atoms is about 10 to the 8 Tesla. Uh, and, you know, the biggest fields we can make practically are about 10 Tesla. You can do 100 Tesla, but, you know, beyond that, you're pretty much stuck. Yes, so you're so, missing um, still a few orders. We're missing a lot of orders, but um, but because you can modulate it, it might be doable. The thing to yeah, maybe, the maybe maybe you can make some predictions about processes that happen in the neighborhood of uh, neutron stars. Yeah, there you have magnetic fields of ten to the thirteenth uh, Tesla. That, that, that's the thing which has come up, which are these um, candy floss planets. They're very low density planets. I think they're made of dark matter, Julius. Okay. <laughs> I think I know what dark matter is. You know, these things have a density of nothing, you know, 0 0.01 that of water. You know, so what are they made of? You know, which material is this that's forming a planet the size of Jupiter and has that density? I mean, think of the physics of that. that things should collapse to something if it's made of any material system except for dark matter, except for something new. So, but coming back to your original question, the new theory is not in contradiction with most of physics. It completely encompasses Maxwell's equations. It's a development of the Dirac equation with the same solutions as Dirac. It has spinner solutions. So, so the solution I've showed, the, uh, the, the, the Van der Mark Williamson electron, is a, is, a, is a spinner. It goes around twice. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a physical spinner. So it has the same solutions. So it completely encompasses, it underpins quantum electrodynamics, it calculates the fine structure constant for quantum electronics, it removes the infinities because it puts the length scale in, lambda c over 4 pi, which is the length scale suggested by Dirac already back 
as the net no scale you needed to cut off electrodynamics to make something work, but he didn't know why he needed that. But now we have a number for it. So and that's, a, that's in, in Dirac's, it's not in the fourth edition, it got taken out, it's in the third edition of quantum mechanics, Dirac's quantum mechanics, if anyone's got access to it, you can look it up. Um, so um, it predicts the quark model, I can generate the quark model, so all the quark stuff is good. I mean, the stuff, most of the standard model is good, as you'd expect, it's not wrong, but it's an ex, this is an extension. I mean, some things are wrong, I don't think that, um, I think when you get into string theories, I think that's just fantasy. That, that's basically mathematicians playing with stuff that can't be tested by experiment. And the only reason they get away with it is because there's nothing to be experimentally tested. So science doesn't work on that. And that's just fantasy land over somewhere else. I, I, I got referees coming back saying, you know, what, what does string theory say about this? So I've got rejected papers on this. But I've got far more rejected papers than published ones. So one of them on this. So I got Green Schwartz in Britain and I read it and I understood it. And what, once I understood it, you know what it did? It sailed across my office and it landed in the bin mm -hmm. because the, the, the central core of that stuff is basically you know, we'll put the symmetries, we'll put um, SU3 cross U2 cross SU3 of color, SU3 of flavor, uh, we'll put U, you know, we'll put SU2 of spin onto there, we'll put U1 of electromagnetic field onto there. We stick all those in the string, in the mathematics of the string. Then, gee whiz, guess what comes out? You get symmetries that you put in to begin with. And that is utterly nothing. There is no extra content. There is no predictive power. It's a complete waste of life and time. Don't anybody go there. There's nothing in it at all. It is absolutely hollow at its heart. And it really, really pissed me off because it took me five years to understand that it was, that's what it was. And when I did talk to the string theorists, I gave a talk at Imperial and there was a string theory group there. And they came over to talk to me afterwards to ask questions like you guys. And one of the young guys, and the guy was saying, you know, and they're sort of going, yes, well, you know, we could do all this. And, and then one of the young guys said, yeah, you know, it does all the things Thouis does, but it has far fewer parameters, he said. And, you know, the string theory at root is correct. You have, you know, the connection between two things, if they're far apart, goes along a line, looks like a string. And it has symmetries. It has fields that are, operate on that, you know, the electromagnetic field is the first one, that it has exchange particles, and the exchange particles are the same exchange particles. The mathematics of spherical harmonics is this thing I've written down is it's not a it, it, it's a quantum it is a quantum mechanics and it has the solutions of quantum mechanics the spherical harmonics it, I could generate Hamiltonians and Lagrangians from it though those devices in the division paper the 2021 paper I just put up are Lagrangians so just look at them so you can you can derive the starting points of Lagrangian field theory or Hamiltonians just the, some of the squares of these things are written in operator form. So it has no contradiction with physics as it stands, and neither should it. Physics as it stands is damn uh, good. Uh, I have a question on that, because you are saying you are doing chemistry, but I do not understand why you are doing chemistry. Chemistry is fine. So what do you offer apart from what you are just saying, uh, the Hamiltonian is... Uh, the same and what, things like what that. A good question. So, so, so uh, what a good question. Uh, uh, Let me tell you a story. I, I understand that you can do some. Uh, I do not understand how, but you said you can do something with that uh, parent orto uh, uh, hydrogen that could be on top of what chemistry can do. But uh, yeah. you have more examples. Dick, that's a lovely question. Thank you very much. And I'll tell you a story. The thing is, I agree with you. I didn't know what the hell I could, what do I know about chemistry? Anyway, Arnie's a chemist, so that helps a lot. So, so the first thing is, and we're working together on this, but um, I put out, a, I think I put it out to the Fanata as well, but I put out a request to get a spectroscopist, a physical chemist, and uh, Michael Mercury, who came to see my talk in San Diego, Maya Martin's talks in San Diego, um, uh, and has been in touch ever since, uh, one of the NASA guys, uh, put me in touch with um, Brian Druin, who's, uh, who's a spectroscopist, chemi uh, physical chemist at, at NASA, looking at, uh, looking, at, um, looking at gases in Earth and in space. And, uh, and the thing is, 
he does chemistry and puts down a Hamiltonian. A Hamiltonian has it's it's half a page of Hamiltonian. It's all the spin couplings. It's you know, L dot S and S dot S and I dot S and all the possible spin couplings are in there, and they have a, a number associated with them. But of these numbers, you can calculate a few. Um, but most of them are fitting parameters. And of course, once you fit them, they have some realm of validity in another molecule. But in fact, they do move around all over the place. And although it looks very impressive, the cognoscenti within the field, and he is one of them, are utterly fascinated by the possibility. He is, or seems to be anyway, so far. But you can actually understand what the quantum spin is doing instead of just putting it in as an energy number, as a Hamiltonian term. Because, of course, if you have a bunch of spins, you've know, got total, the good quantum numbers, the total spin J and, and, and JZ for any system. But J is equal to L squared plus S squared plus I squared, the nuclear spin, plus the actual rotation of the spin, the spinning rotation of that, squared, all of those squared. And, the, um, and, and JZ is a, a vector combination of those things as well, where the vectors add up to um, J equals eventually has to be a unit, 0, 1, 2, for the total thing, because otherwise you don't have a coherence. So you don't have a phase going around. It's one of the quantization conditions. So the reason they're good quantum numbers is that J squared and, and, and JZ represent a quantum number. But the JZ represents a quantum number for the reason I just gave you. When I explained to him that the reason the quantum spin did what it did for, for JZ, that when you do an integral over a trivector, you get an object which is in a one-dimensional space, so it can only be up or down. There is no sideways in a one-dimensional space. He was delighted with that. It's in the understanding of what's happening. And then in the engineering, you, you see, he says, look, it's quite simple. I've got this Hamiltonian, and it describes very well what's happening. But I can take any term from out I like, and the others will just, and the fitting probe will fit them all perfectly. It just moves the energies around a little bit. They don't mean very much. I mean, one knows that these things um, affect the energy. And he says, also, remember, I might be measuring 100 spectral lines, but I'm only really measuring three things, because these things are are all related to one another. You have a whole series of lines that are related by a series of uh, hyperfine steps, where some of the lines get split again by the fine structure, then by the hyperfine structure, et cetera, et cetera. So the actual number of... So, so the thing is that a, a lot of that, although that subject seems to be well understood by somebody who's not in the field, as is often the case, for example, the experiment that Henk and Carlo and I did on quantum interference of electrons, where we, we propose that electrons interfere with themselves. These are fermions interfering with themselves. And we have a paper on that. I have a paper with my name on it saying that is wrong. And when I tried to submit another paper saying uh, Williamson and Van Houten and Baneker and Van Bees were wrong in this paper, uh, I got it re rejected on the grounds that there was a review article by Baneker, Van Houten and Van Bees saying that it was quantum interference. So, but it isn't. It's just a rough edge on the on the sample, the uh, structure on the uh, electron focus, and this just comes from a rough rough edge, because we can uh, measure it. And, uh, it's nothing to do with quantum interference, and of course, fermions don't interfere with themselves. Bosons do, as Reiner can tell you, right? Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes Reiner. Yeah, I have a question about that, and actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in line with the question of Dick, so my perception of the problem of quantum chemistry. Uh, of using quantum chemistry in engineering. You are very weakly on the You're very faint, uh, Reiner. I can scarcely hear you. I don't know if oh, you can turn okay. things up or talk yeah, to the microphone. Do you know if I go to the screen or? No, so that definitely yes. helps. It helps Get a bit. Do you know where the microphone can. is? Do you know where the microphone is? Left or right? Try left and right. I never have a problem, but only now. I don't know what the problem is. I'm going to turn you up anyway. Right, go for it. Can you hear me better? Yes, I can. We can hear you good enough, well enough. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, so to my perception, the problem um, in quantum chemistry uh, to be used in, uh, for example, engineering applications um, is um, the problem of many particle. Um, exactly. And so exchange and correlation, of course, those subjects are very easy if there's extreme localization, because then you can confine yourself to a, a, one, one atom or one molecule or so or the other way around, eh? like we have in, 
in, in, um, in free electron from less matter physics. But the reality is precisely somewhere in the middle in many cases, where You're right. it's not so clear uh, to what extent um, uh, yeah, exchange of correlation can be treated well. And, um, uh, and making approximations to that is, uh, is, is the big hurdle towards massive applications of quantum chemistry in engineering. And so my question is, 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 do you see a prospect for improving that? Yes, I do. And that's the best question I've ever had, I think, from that's so to the point. And, and that's exactly the point. The thing is that these spaces are interlinked. So you're right, you have a many body problem. So for example, the many body, body problem, you've got, you've got to sum up all these energies and you have 96 of them. Some of these Hamiltonians go over two pages. So you have all of these things, but, it's, but they're coming from many bodies, they're coming from many systems. However, for example, the energy of the total system can be given by an integral over all of these things, but it can also be given by Planck's constant times of frequency, which is a lot simpler. So, so, so if one can find what that resonance is, because the space are interlinked, they constrain one another. So they reduce the, complex, the total complexity of the system. So if one looks at the thing as being as well in energy space as in a coherence in field space, as in a coherence in spin space, those things constrain the available states to produce a complete coherence. Okay. They add extra constraints. In, in chemistry, the, the link between um, energetic states on the one hand and, and taking properly the real structure into account and all the positions of the atoms and their vibrations as a result of a realistic uh, thermal uh, activation. And so that, that's the, the real challenge for uh, you, you, You're it, absolutely it, right. And, and of course, in reality, in quantum chemistry as well, uh, there'll be more than one configuration which will be allowed. So, for example, the case of alpha and parahydrogen is a very simple one. But as soon as one gets to more complex molecules, there may be a whole bunch of states which are thermalized between one another as well. And, 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 hence, and, and hence all... Now, the hope is that, that one simplifies this by having a look at... Um, but by What happens with quantization is the thing clicks on to particular possibilities. So, for example, the oxygen molecule doesn't go to, although the spin zero state exists, it's higher energy than spin one. Why? Because the oxygen has a symmetry which is like cylindrical. So it has a spin axis. It has one spin axis and hence spin one. But there are six electrons contributing to that spin in the para-hydrogen, in, 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 sorry, in the paramagnetic uh, oxygen. But they only contribute one unit of spin because there's only one axis. So, and, and those spin coherences are quite sharp-edged if one's looking at energy, one's, one's looking at the energy from, well, okay, the base energy is inverse square from the electric system, and that constrains things to a certain extent. Then you have the spin linkages, which go inverse Q, at, at least at a distance. But these one, but the spin linkages, the spin coherences, when the thing clicks on to a particular spin, are hard-edged. Why are they hard-edged? Because if you move a little bit away from the quantum spin, you get a, you get a, a dissonance. So if one can find those states for any given configuration, so in oxygen it's simple, it's just that axis. If you go to, um, to um, ozone, to O3, the hope, which is bent, that the hope is that you can describe that as well as, 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 uh, as, uh, as a reduced dimensional problem by having a look at what's, been, what's happening in the spin space of these objects. So the hope is that one gets extra constraints from the extra equations. If it, well, not just from the extra equations, but from the extra, from the extra space in which one lives. One's not just looking uh, from, from looking at spin correlations. So the hope is, and what we're going to try and do is look at the numbers of this, and we can look at spin correlations. And what we're looking at, Arnie and I, and, and Brian, um, is we're looking at, at, at um, spin sharing. So spin sharing can happen if we have two spinning objects, they can line up in two different kinds of ways symmetrically. One of them is axially, so you have spin on spin, like, like magnet north-south to north-south, but they can also line up next to each other. And then by looking at different series, so you look at O2, but you look at NO and so forth, one, one can have a look at how those, as, as you change the, um, as, as you change the molecule, one can hope to get a functional form for the spin coupling, like a spin force. 
that's much simpler than the kind of thing that's done at the moment, which is to say that all objects can couple with all objects. If one can look at the con what the configuration is going to be, and that's the thing that one can do in spin space, what is the configuration? What's a logical configuration in spin space? Now, Arnie's much better at this kind of thing than me. You're right, Ryder. And um, actually, I think one of the other things I need to do is I'm pretty crap at public relations. But, but one thing I would like to ask Fanatin's help for is once COVID restrictions uh, die down, I'd like to come to Holland and talk to some, well, give a series of talks at different universities on this. And I can do both dark matter, uh, there's a dark matter talk, and obviously, this has been a two hour talk talking to you guys, you have a proper attention span. But uh, nonetheless, I'd love to give a series of uh, seminars at, uh, in Holland. And I know that Inga will uh, put me up if I come over there. So I'll have a base in, in Eindhoven. So, uh, so, um, but I'd like, to, I'd like to do a tour of the universities and perhaps extend it to some of those strange countries to the north and south and east and west like Germany and Belgium as well. So, um, so Maybe stage. you should start at, uh, at physics at Veldhoven. There you can meet uh, the whole ch uh, all the people together. Yes, yes, for, yeah, perfect, indeed. Yes, yeah, yes. If, if right you too. want to do that, you have, um, I think, uh, twelve hours for submitting the episodes. <laughs> well, I better get on with it then. <laughs> <laughs> we say that point at twelve o'clock sharp. Okay, well, look, maybe I'll just do that, Rinder. <laughs> 12 o'clock tomorrow. 12 o'clock noon, eh? in the afternoon. 12 noon, okay. So no, shall I go to bed Western, and wake Western up fresh? Or just... Western European time. Uh, sorry, well, 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 Middle European time. I'm, I'm presenting at the Vigier conference, but w w when is the Veldhoven conference? Yeah, um, about 20 of January or something like that. Okay, so it's still a few months away. We might be we might be lucky, and COVID will have died out by then. Yeah. Good. I, I, have, I have to leave, but uh, thank you very much, uh, John. And uh, Ryder, it's a pleasure. Bye for all the others. I'm stepping out as well. Bye bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Uh, John, okay. I still have a question before you leave. Uh, yeah, go uh, on then. I wonder, uh, instead of uh, uh, struggling with uh, multi-particle systems, why don't you? just try to calculate the mass of a neutron and, uh, for instance, explain why we never measured the monopole, magnetic monopole, or where is the antimatter in the universe? So these well, okay. are very concrete questions that, that require an answer. Right, I'll tell you. Here's the answer, and it needs a paper. The answer is, the answer may lie in mathematics. If everything runs through the pivot, through so, so all of these th things flow through the scalar, there are there are a couple of possibilities. The possibility is that um, the pivot follows mathematics as it stands, and minus pivot times minus pivot is plus pivot, and plus pivot times plus pivot is plus pivot. Now, if that's the case, and the pivot is plus, and it turns out to be plus positive for the electron, a negative charge gives you positive pivot, then you have a mechanism for converting for the asymmetry of matter and antimatter in the universe. Because, because if the stuff flows through that, what happens is you, in, in the creation process, you are uh, you are uh, annihilating antimatter yeah. uh, through the. Yeah, but that would be that would be an explanation, uh, and the same uh, holds for uh, the missing mo magnetic multiples. But, uh, but calculating the mass, no, no, calculating the mass of a neutron would be a quantitative number that people can verify. You're right. Now let me think about how to do that. 
Um, it's not immediately clear to me what to do with that, but that, you're right, that would be a good one. The monopole I can do. The, but the experiments have been done already. Yeah? The Newton oscillations have been, measurements have been done. Uh, but uh, the quantitative uh, calculation of the mass. You're right. And then That's compare it to the experiments. Okay. Um, I did have a look at masses a long time ago. I'll have a go. A good, good suggestion, France. I'll have a think about how to do that. I don't see how to do it straight away, but it's a very good one. You're right. Yes, thank you. Okay. I think it's also time for me to, to go now. Yeah, me, me, me too. It's well past my bedtime with a Beethoven thing coming up. <laughs> so. It was Great nice to, uh, nice to see you and uh, nice to, uh, to see much. all these nice questions. Okay. Especially, 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 especially the old guard. Dick, you too. Fantastic <laughs> to see you guys. You take care. Yeah. Yeah, bye. It, it, it's such a pleasure to see you. So yeah. we, Thank you very much. You. Yes. <laughs> bye bye, Arnie. Bye. See you next time. <laughs>